thought you didn't want to sit by. I got it. Okay. Hello. I don't have to So we're getting the, the YouTube live stream up. Okay. So we're getting the, the YouTube live. Okay. There we go. All right. So, okay. So Dan is getting his laptop hooked up. And uh, he'll be ready to go here in just a few moments, I think. I think so. Uh, yeah. Can say. you make me uh, like bigger so I can see me? Yes, I will make you the man, and I'm going to mute myself. And then we will share your screen. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Can everybody hear me out there? <laughs> yes. Oh shit! Yeah. Yes, yes, nicely. How do you know? They should raise their hand or something. Raise your hand if you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, I, I've like muted myself. Okay, so where where did I go? Ah, you're the computer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the music. Yeah. They don't mind me. Yeah, I heard my Too complicated. Uh -huh. oh, well, um, I don't know. Uh, Let me try that and we'll unmute the TV and see yeah. if that works. Hello? Hello? Are you muted, Dan? No. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Yes. You're coming through to New Mexico. Hello? Yes, here. What's that? You you can hear us? Yes. Okay, good. All right, fine. Yeah, it's just coming through your computer. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And my, can I do that now? Yes, you should be able to. Okay. I wasn't prepared to to go right now. We were going to test it out first, and uh, we didn't get a chance to do that. In the middle of the bottom. Thing. Yeah, but I'm I'm not ready yet. I have to go to the presentations and open it. I'm not going to share my. Howard, screen. can you make him full size? Howard, can you make him full size, full screen? I'm pretty much full size. Okay, hit escape. <laughs> Again, hit escape. Hit escape. No, I just got to go over to the, I got to go over here and now I can share my screen, but I wanted to share just. Aspect of the monitor. Have you got the, your presentation? The presentation is right here. Okay. So you can share you screen. Say you share screen. I did. Okay. Yeah. And then you should see your presentation oh. up here somewhere. Oh, lots of pictures. Whiteboard. So next year, somebody can give a presentation on how to run Zoom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why isn't I know it, I've had trouble too. Well, it's it's one thing being a participant, and it's another thing Sorry, running like it. That. Oh, that's isn't that it right there? Yeah, I'm on a Zoom call. Yeah, this week, is it. Actually. This is my application. Okay. okay. One of the people. Yeah. Now here, I want to share that. That it, well, it doesn't seem like it. That's that's oh, Howard's, yeah. Bruce Howard's. 
to be able to share your screen. Well, can I share the whole screen? Yeah. How, how do I do that? I think you just hit that. All right. Sorry, everybody. I'm so lame. Uh, yeah. Now, if we'd asked you to design a telescope for us in three minutes, it would have been a different. Uh, I know how computers work. To believe it, I could make one out of transistors, <laughs> but I don't know how to do this. Now, how can I get this thing up so that it's off? Pretty much there. Yeah, it's the aspect ratio of the. Oh, up there, it's okay. All yeah. right. Okay, fine. Does anybody recognize this? Yeah, I do. No. Looks like a three of one. Yeah. And, uh, and we've, uh, we're talking to Oyenata in uh, New York, uh, 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 New York University. Uh, Dr. Valerie, and I can't think of her last name, um, uh, wanted to get this telescope to work. They've had it for years, and it's the largest telescope in New York, she told me. And it doesn't work. It won't track. They still use it, just kind of pointing it around once in a while, but uh, they wanted to upgrade it. You can see this got a little, if you can see my mouse, that little hand controller there. But that only works on equatorial telescopes, and it doesn't work on you know, this is in the early 19 or 2000s. Anyway, she um, uh, wanted us to upgrade it. And so we gave a proposal, but it was too much money because we had to make too many parts. And uh, so she said, well, we have somebody here that can make the parts. Or maybe I suggested it. I don't know. And uh, so uh, that's what happened. Their machinist, Alan, I'll think of his name a little later, his last name. And he made all the parts except for two that I'll show you in a minute. So this is the azimuth. And if you can look at my mouse, this is a gear. Ooh. This gear is stationary. This is the motor. And it's got a, a little uh, worm gear in it. that, And then it goes down and there's a spur gear that makes this azimuth go around. And there's some rollers under here. Whoops. That's the azimuth motor. This is the existing. And it actually works, but they wanted a new one. So we designed this up. This is kind of a close up. We bought these new uh, Pittman motors with no reducers. And then we got this, uh, this, uh, oh, uh, you can't see it on the screen. No. Okay. You can, you can show it after you stop sharing. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll show this stuff later on the on to you Zoom land people, and this is a fifty to one uh, um, harmonic drive, and then we we made a gear on the bottom. You'll see that that on the bottom pretty soon. We're also putting on Renishaw encoders, so we provided the encoders. We provided this adjuster, reed head adjuster, and that's a two hundred millimeter ring, and it's very accurate. So this should turn this telescope into a really nice professional telescope, especially if they ever can afford a rotator. <laughs> and this is uh, another view. Uh, it's pretty simple. And he's already made all this stuff, and uh, Alan. And this is the CAD drawing. This, this shaft, which is in orange, was solid. And I said, well, you know, before you, this was done by a battery, and they didn't have any wires on it. You're going to need wires. You need power and USB. And so uh, Alan took this orange shaft completely off. He he drilled three holes, right, like for mounting this, so that the the um, this uh, ring holder would be uh, perfect. And he drilled bored a hole all the way through it. And this is a, an exploded view. You can see the three holes here, and the three holes on this green plate, which it's not really green, but this is the underneath. There's a shaft that goes uh, all the way down. There's no bearing down there. It's just a hole. And this is a, uh, uh, God, I can't remember what this stuff is, but it's got a nice CTE that kind of matches the ring. And, and it's a lot easier to machine than stainless. So he built all this stuff. I think he 3D printed this yellow part. Here's the other part of that same little thing that I was showing you earlier. And, um, and that's, so this is still going to walk the, the telescope azimuth around. Now we're going to the altitude, 
and <clears throat> this is the altitude gear and this is actually a clutch so we're probably going to lock it so they can't use a clutch anymore uh, this is a face-on view of the clutch and here's the existing motor that's that uh, that moves at the altitude and you can see the teeth clearly there and this is a battery that's there now that will will be will be deleting that now everybody here that's been looking at this boomerang now you can see what it's for <laughs> and it, it holds the the reed head and we have a similar arrangement on this uh, uh, encoder ring but we had to get the reed head way up there so and the reason we made it out of steel instead of aluminum is because of the cte did we didn't want it to get closer you know it's, it's lower than aluminum and it's got a similar arrangement and this is a the motor bracket and uh alan had me design it and split it up so he could glue it together because his uh, 3d printer wasn't big enough for it so then he um tested it out on the telescope and it fit pretty well so and that's it for the first part this is supposed to be about radio telescopes but it's actually three projects one is a, pr a prospective project that i hope we can do and so some of you might have oh i wanted to tell you i did have a conversation with uh jim uh what's his last name jim i can't think of it. jim burr and and he was helpful and, and he was appreciative that it was going to be fixed and working and it was really nice he's in his 80s i think and and um it, it was a good conversation and i found out the pitch of that gear which is <laughs> i i wouldn't i'm doing this all remotely because they couldn't afford to fly me out there to test to check it out all right what's that yeah yeah it's pretty free yeah yeah i love it <laughs> um kind of two questions regarding uh drive gears like that um when i built my um go to i was advised uh to use a timing belt on, on the azimuth and it mm -hmm. kind of has a a tensioner and wrap around and all that and i was thinking somebody that wasn't you but somebody said i nah, don't don't try to use that timing belt and put your gear right up against it because uh, you'll get a bunch of well, yeah that could have been me it's probably you yeah it, it, the comment being that it would just walk out of the teeth of the gear and i see but you're doing just exactly that here how, how does that work <laughs> Uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh, then I'll get you later. Um, because it's a maybe it's a subtlety between a machine gear and a timing belt. I don't know. But um, yeah, how how do we keep the the gear from going up and down? Or or walking out of the teeth or just skipping a tooth or. Something? Oh no, it it won't happen. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, unless it's not centered at all. But I'm pretty sure it would be. And then go forward. Yeah, that's what I used. Yeah. So okay, I'll get you later. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions yeah. about this one? It's a 40 inch. Oh, and by the way, it's got a, a flat secondary and then a tertiary that comes out. So you don't have to get up on a ladder. Uh, I, I've never looked through one, but I'm expecting a, a nice dark uh, out of focus uh, dark spot in the in the image of a star. The secondary looks like it's maybe 20 inches or so. I think something like that. Oh, yeah. Big. Yeah. What did they plan to do with it? Well, she does uh, likes to, uh, to do uh, galaxy stuff. I can't remember now. And they also like to do exoplanets. Yeah. And they'll probably get into satellites since the software duck works so well with that. Okay. So any other questions from Zoom land? Guess not. Okay. So this, oh, back up. Okay. Um, Vishnu Reddy, Dr. Vishnu Reddy from the University of Arizona uh, got two radio telescopes. And the purpose of them is to do astrometry. It's not like listening to satellites. Uh, it's for tracking satellites. And, and it's they don't do any communication with it. They just listen to the radio frequency and then they can tell where the satellite is. And it's not nearly as accurate as optical, but you can do it in the daytime when it's raining. 
also maybe you can you can't find it with an uh, and you'll be able to find it with a radio telescope so that's the whole purpose of these it's kind of a new experiment i think this is biosphere two biosphere two and uh right over here is the observatory and this image was taken before they had the radio telescopes it's just right about whoops oh well it's right about in here they put the radio telescopes and this is a you never know what you're going to get there i've been there about four or five times and i love going there it's just fun here's the two radio telescopes what was that was just in <laughs> yeah or, or bobcats bob yeah cats. yeah so uh, this is a small one, the 2.4 meter right in the foreground. And in the background is a 5.3 meter. And they all have double worms. So if you can see my mouse, here's here, this motor turns a worm and that turns another uh, worm gear. And that, that worm gear, this worm turns a worm gear. This worm turns another worm gear, which turns a telescope in azimuth. Uh, they all have that except for this altitude uses an Acme thread. So this one is going to be very nonlinear. And I found out, let's see, we'll see that. Oh, <clears throat> getting out of order here. So what this is going to be, it's a one pixel camera, the uh, radio telescope is. But so what we're going to do, we're going to settle on four or three uh, squared uh, and take images of a, and so we'll make our own image. So then we can do astrometry, or they can do astrometry with uh, where where exactly that beam is. <clears throat> and uh, it's gonna be nonlinear because of this thing. So I'm gonna have to do a little math so that when I control the motor, it's gonna control the same as the encoder feedback, which we'll get into a little bit later. And I found out that the laws of cosines will solve this pretty easily. And uh, I made a little spreadsheet and checked it out. And so the, the math is in hand. And I'm not a mathematician, but you know, me and the internet work out pretty good sometimes. <clears throat> so I have to put those in uh, our SciTech EXE software uh, and you know, put in, so we can put in the links and the uh, threads per inch and all that stuff. So, <clears throat> and uh, here's another image of it. So this is the altitude motor and every motor on, the, on all four motors, they all have a reducer on here. And then that goes into the uh, the shaft of the of the worm. In this case, it goes into the shaft of the nut, the Acme nut. <clears throat> so, okay, I already mentioned this. And there's uh, plenty of backlash because we took the motors off and then we turned the shafts and it's really easy for, you know, quite a long time. And then, then you can fill it, start turning the telescope. You go the other way, it does the same thing. And and so uh, I'm gonna have to put backlash in the Force 2 controller to compensate for that as best we can. And uh, <clears throat> all right, so what I did first was I looked at the horsepower of all the motors and then I turned that into a torque value and I've come up with these huge motors and reducers with reducers on them. But then when I visited the site, um, we carefully measured the torque of every one by using a, a lever and a spring scale. And it's way less than, than I thought. And we were able to eliminate all of the gear reducers, every one of them. And uh, the only one that needed a bigger motor, they're all using the same, pr pretty much the same size motors, except for the altitude for the 5.4 no, meter uh it's uh you know it's not balanced so you have to lift it up so that one takes a bigger motor but still it doesn't need a uh, um a uh a reducer so they, they, we're going to be able to slew a lot faster a lot faster here's the existing gear reducers that we're eliminating this one in particular the 2.4 meter altitude is a 10 to 1 and then after that is the acme thread and uh <clears throat> I'll show you the slew speed. It's unbelievable. But uh, this is the, one of the motors for that small telescope. It's a, a quarter horsepower. 
and it's a 10 to 1 ratio, 480 volt and 720 RPM. And this is unbelievable. <clears throat> so uh, Vishnu and, and the uni university bought these telescopes from England, a company in England. Turns out they were made in China. And uh, can I say the S word? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, stupid. I, I mean, so uh, you guys probably know what these are. They're, they're um, solid state relays. So you can turn the motor on and you can turn it off. And they're induction motors. That's the other thing. They are induction motors. And if anybody knows anything about induction motors, you know you can't really position them very well. Uh, you can, If you have a VFD, you can sort of position them. A VFD is a variable frequency drive, so you can change the frequency. Like we use 60 hertz, so instead of 60, we can use 30 or 40 or whatever and make it be any speed. And so, you know, you could do a little better with a VFD, but still, you would never try to position a telescope of any kind with a, a an induction motor. And that's what all these four motors are. In the case of the 2.4 meter, they're not even VFDs. They're like relays. Okay, go fast. Okay, we're there. Go shut it off real quick. I mean, that's what the software, their software is, does, I guess. Uh, so what were they thinking, I said? <laughs> so Dan, with the red controller, you can't control them. Yes, I looked into that. And there's so there's two control. two VFDs that sort of work. No, there's, uh, there's actually another way to do it with, with amps and base control. Or yeah, uh, I read up on them uh, yeah. on it, and I decided against it. And I've seen a, I've seen a twenty horsepower induction motor uh -huh. modeling a, a quartz watch. Okay, yeah. well, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, it costs you to do. okay, interesting. <laughs> All right, All right. This is what's really kind of cool. Uh, Point zero point zero seven seven degrees per second. That's how fast the altitude on the two point four meter uh, slewed, yeah. and and um, the reason they did that is because of the problem of hey the, let's turn them on and off, and then we can get it close and it's going to be it's going to stay right there or you can just kind of predict a little bit the the deacceleration, and then it stops. You can't track. There's no way you could ever track a satellite that way, but anyway. Uh, 20 minutes to move from the horizon to the zenith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right this is uh, one of the encoders. I put it sideways so that I could get more of a picture on, on it. Um, and there's limit switches. There's four encoders, one for each axis on the two telescopes. And they're absolute encoders. They're magnetic. We looked up the specs. Their accuracy is a quarter of a degree. Oh. And that's the beam width, according to Vishnu. That's the the beam width of of um of the um uh, radio transmitter or the that's the that's what they can see. The, the beam width is what's that? The field of view. Yeah. Yes, I think so. <sighs> okay, what were they thinking? So we decided to replace those with Renishaws, and. Uh, all you in Zoom land, I'll show you the prototype when we're done with this. With um, when I turn out my camera on, I have. Uh, so this is what I what we came up with. So there's the encoder read head, the one in the uh, cyan colored, and then the blue colored is the encoder ring. The the darker purple is made out of Delrin, and the pinkish is all made out of Delrin too, and uh, we just. Uh, eat all that out with our NC mill and drill all the holes and it takes about a half an hour. <laughs> and then that's with the lid on it and you can see the the shaft sticking down at the bottom. Uh, this is exploded view. So there's really only four parts to make, including the lid at the top. All right. <clears throat> so this is a the uh, five point, no, six point, what did I say? 6.4 meter, right? I think, it was, I think you said 5.3, 5. 5. 5. that's right. This is the, the altitude axis, and this is the one that uses the biggest motor. I think this one is a three horsepower motor, uh, but again, it's a double worm, uh, and, and, uh, and it's, so we don't need nearly that. 
It's got a 10 to 1 reducer on it, three horsepower motor. This is an azimuth. And this is a control box. So you can see that little hand controller there. Uh, no, that's not a Celestron hand pad. <laughs> it's, it's just go this way, that way, or the other way. That's all it can do. And those are the two VFDs. Um, if you can see my mouse. This is a one VFD, that's the other VFD, variable frequency drive. The rest of it, I'm not sure what all of this stuff is, but it's mostly all gonna go. This up here is a radio receiver and all that. Now you can write lots of books about what I don't know about that. So that's all up to them, but they say that's not a problem for them. So I'm okay with that. We're gonna use our force two because of the big motors. Um, and uh, here's, here's an installation we did in Chile. Uh, I think about, almost a year ago now. Uh, you like those electrolytic, 3D printed electrolytic capacitors, those purple ones? And then that's a bridge rectifier down there at the bottom. Uh, I'll put my mouse on them. So these are electrolytic capacitors. This is a bridge rectifier. That's the power supply. We're doing a similar thing, but we'll buy real ones. Now, the reason we printed the, we had to ship this before we got the parts. <laughs> So we 3D printed parts and wired it. <laughs> and then when I went down there, I brought the parts with me and, and put them in. So that's another uh, story. <clears throat> so this is uh, one of the motors that um, we're going to uh, put on there. This is a Siemens motor. It's pretty powerful. And we're making this. I'll show you this orange part. I have one with me. And then we have these, these uh, blue plates cut, but we have to machine them. And let's see if this movie works. So this is one of the motors. We just got them late last week, and so I hooked it up. And <clears throat> now it looks like it's going slow, but it's not. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, the, the interface between the frames per second and the, there, now it's slowed down. So let's see. Yes. And that's it for the radio telescopes. Uh, we're going to probably, they want to do it in November. So this coming month, um, uh, we have uh, one of the guys that worked for us for a lot of years. His name's Daniel. And uh, we taught him how to run machines. Well, he, we hired him to work on the grounds. We have a lot of acreage. And, um, and then he went to work for sidereal technology out there and he learned how to machine how to weld he learned how to program machines i mean it's, he's you know about young man about 30 some and some other company stole him from us <clears throat> and so we did all that training and he went to another company can you believe that i mean and and the company that he went to is here, TMS, which is our mother company anyway. So, I mean, it's all good. I'm still his boss. I'm still his boss, but, you know, when they really need him on a ship on the East Coast, uh, you can't say no. So so we've really struggled to get uh, work done. On the, but, but he's going to be back next week to work at Sidereal. So we're hoping to make a lot of progress. So anybody have any questions about this? So the customer for this project do they have a realistic idea of where they're starting and where they want to end up? Well, that, obviously they're going to end up like way better, but what is their, you know, <laughs> what a good question. <laughs> and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, talking to Vishnu, uh, they get, they uh, misled him. They thought this is going to work perfect right out of the box. They can do all this stuff. And they spent weeks over there, and and Vishnu called me up. He, I mean, he was angry. I, I mean, really angry. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do, but but uh, we're going to make it work. <laughs> what kind of steam rate are you going to get out of these scales? Uh, well, for instance, that one that was 0. 0.077 degrees per second, it's going to be 0. 0.77 degrees per second, roughly, uh, because we're not going to have a reducer on it. And uh, and we could go faster if we use higher voltage, and we could do that. If they wanted to go faster, we'd have to, but I doubt if they'll want to go faster. We're running at 170 volts DC. I have a question outside of your purview on this. I noticed that those smaller radio dishes were they have extremely fast 
F ratio, like they look like they were F point two five or something. Very well, could be. Yeah, they, they almost look like the nose of a bullet or something. You want to go back and look at it real quick? Yeah, they're really deep. Um, What would they use these for? Is it to collect data? Uh, astrometry. Uh, that means finding out where they are in the sky. Yeah, that's really quite amazing, isn't it? That's really, true. both of them. Extraordinarily fast. Uh, yeah. Fish. Well, fish is usually not. I mean, faster than. Well, the bigger ones were way more shallow, but these guys are like, they're deep. I'm just guessing F. Point two five or something, or less than that. That's actually a lot faster than that. I think That's right. faster than that. I Absolutely. think, yeah. Uh, I don't know that. I don't know what it is, but you know, I just pointed. So we're going to have accurate encoders. We're going to have a lot faster slew speeds, and uh, we're going to have software. You can re use SciTech EXE. Probably many of you know you can track satellites with, and it's, it's, so it's just going to work. You know. Okay, I just learned a new word yesterday uh victorian engineering and uh that was from uh howard banich because i showed him some some of my pictures or something and and uh, I, I was telling him how amazed i was at the technology in the 1890s so i have uh, before we go on to this third project that we do not have a purchase order for we've just done a prevent preliminary report and that's all we've done so far and we've also made their telescope work. You'll see that story in a little bit. <clears throat> but this is the largest refractor in the solar system. Uh, I asked uh, John Briggs yesterday, and he said there might have been some other attempts. He said the most, the only successful. And so, well, maybe I put that in here. <laughs> uh, thanks to John Briggs. And this is the telescope. Does anybody recognize this? That's right. This is what John Briggs was talking about, which was a wonderful talk. I just enjoyed that so much yesterday. Well, there's Einstein. Yeah, there. I was looking at that. <clears throat> yeah, there he is. Okay, so they, they want to refurbish this. And this is Dr. Amanda Bauer that's in charge of it. This uh, this whole observatory now is uh, uh, the Yerkes Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that owns it now and operates it. And uh, Dr. Amanda Bowers is the head of the telescopes and everything like that. And uh, they want to do two things, and they're both pretty big jobs. Um, actually, item one is a lot harder than item two. But even item two um, uh, is going to be you know, some challenges. Um, and I got to say again, this is not for sure. This is an idea. They flew us out there, uh, several several of us, and we'll you'll see us all later on. And um, <clears throat> but I would bet that we're going to do it. That's my that's my uh, guess. But don't go around saying that we we got the job because we don't. And I, you know, there is going to be some tension between the cosmetic restoration and making it work well, because we're going to have motors sticking out there. If they want it to work well, we're going to have motors. And the, and uh, Amanda wanted to have all the old handles, like the, for the clamping, you turn it and tighten the clamp and all this stuff. She wanted to have it look like that. So maybe we can have fake handles. I don't know. What, that's not my department. Okay. <laughs> if you took a look at my desk, I should have put a picture of my desk in here. But incredible engineering, Victorian engineering for 1890s technology, um, push buttons and contactors and some meters and, and things that were just coming out back then. I'll show you a picture of the, of the motor later on, one of the motors. And uh, they have tangent arms. I made a tangent arm uh, in my early tw or 20s or 30s when I was 20 or 30 years old for my little Mead German equatorial mount. And so I could guide in, in declination, you know? I mean, so this has uh, uh, been around a long time. And then the clamps for transferring one to the other. And and slewing, it's amazing. I'll, I have a video of it slewing. It's quite amazing. And then, but the nice thing is on the right ascension, they do have a worm gear, a huge worm gear. I mean, it's huge. 
And I want to take advantage of that because then we can, uh, you can leave it there for cosmetics if you want, or you can take it off. The tangent arm we won't need, the clamping system we won't need, and we can do everything with the worm gear. And I, I hope we can do that. Right now, if you see that little green circle there, that's a function generator, which is just a thing that puts out a square wave or a sine wave or whatever. They're just putting out a square wave. And here's a close-up of it. And that's the frequency, 4186. And that I looked at, uh, I did the math, and it looks right. That goes to this little thing, which is just a stepper driver, and it has a pulse input. But that thing has been up there. I've been... In, looking at this telescope for other reasons. We did the we upgraded the other two telescopes there. And so I got a chance to look at this. And this been the, that function generator has been there for years. Uh, Bob Briggs, I mean, John Briggs probably knows uh, uh, when it was put on. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, uh, but it's been there for years. And that's their sidereal tracking. They, they, they can't adjust it. If they want to go faster or slower, they have to run up there and turn the knob. This is a stepper motor, the back of it. And what's that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, 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 not a bellows coupling, that's a, but it's a coupling. And this is kind of an overall, this tells you how it works. The stepper motors goes in there, turns a small worm, which turns the worm gear, which turns the big worm, which turns the great big worm gear. Oh, this is a, another movie. Cool. There's looks like a hundred teeth on on that uh, worm gear. I mean, worm, yeah, worm gear. There's uh, three hundred sixty teeth on the worm, the main worm. Yep. All right, so um, so we we re plan to remove this stepper motor and put in a, a powerful brushless motor, and we'll be able to slew at one and a half degrees a second, which is what we timed at the existing is one and a half degrees a second, and um, and uh, I do want to check with John Briggs to to make sure he thinks that this is a good idea, but my only fear would be if that gear is not made to slew for long terms of slewing. Uh, uh, so I, I'll be asking John about that. I saw a rope from that telescope yesterday. I have a feeling a lot of times they just pull a rope. Yes, uh, they, there's there's clutches on it. And right now the, the declination motor, the, the gear is stripped. It's a fiber gear. And uh, so they, the only way they can use the declination is move it by hand. Okay. So right when we left, and then um, uh, yeah. Ralph Nye stayed one more and worked with uh, uh, Amanda, and then the the tangent arm on the right ascension stopped working, and that's terrible because you basically can't use a telescope uh, because you can only kind of move it, but you know it's so powerful you can't you know line it up by hand. You have to use push buttons, and, and you know so it's really frustrating. So it became useless. I don't know what was wrong. Uh, they didn't figure that out. But we have a step and direction controller, and that little um, electronic device I showed you earlier has step and direction inputs. And so uh, ta I talked to Amanda, and, and she was OK with it. We loaned her a controller, and so it's working now. And now she can control it with push buttons, just like the old tangent arm but it's done with speeding up and slowing down the, or reversing that stepper motor. And this is our step and direction controller. And uh, and we're only using one axis, of course, just the right ascension. And 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 I worked with him online I, and we got went it as fast as we could safely go and not stop you know, spinning because of the low torque and stuff. And there's another story, but I'm not gonna go into that one. This is one of the tangent arms uh, this is a de uh, right ascension tangent arm, I believe. Yes. I said declination, but I think that's the right ascension. And if you can see my mouse, well, actually, there's a close-up. 
So this motor is a fine guiding thing. So it's a shaft. And then that turns this gear, which turns this gear, which turns this main shaft. And then the course is this motor, which, you know, push, pulls it or pushes this tangent arm. And that's just, this is a slow motion or the, I guess, uh, I call it pan mode. Uh, most people call it uh, set. And uh, I, I can't remember, set and guide or something. Anyway, on the declination, we are going to have to use um, this because we can't, uh, the gear train for the declination, it starts out inside of the, with a motor I'll show you, and then it goes up through all these bevel gears. And then it, one of the bevel gears has a special angle. So it goes up the right ascension shaft in the middle of the shaft and turns another bevel gear, which turns the the declination. And it is uh, lots of backlash and no doubt a lot of periodic gear. And so um, we'll probably move it, do some software where we move it to where it's supposed to go uh, roughly. And then we'll probably use this motor. Well, not this motor. We'll put on a, another servo motor that will uh, position it. But we only need one because we can control the speed. Yeah, this is the one that we're going to use. I kind of said everything that's on this page. Um, so I first went to work to the, at the shipyard in uh, 1986 or so. And there were some ships, Matson ships, that still used direct current for all their motors on their ship. They had direct current generators and direct current motors. I don't think there's any ships like that anymore. But I learned a lot about direct um, DC motors. This is a shunt field, if you can see my mouse. Um, this, uh, there's probably a series field. Maybe this is too old, because this is 19, uh, 1890s is when, well, look at the nameplate. That kind of says it all, yeah, except for it only tells me the voltage. It doesn't say the amps. I wish it would have. But I did measure the current, and and it comes out to be, if you go by the standard 750 watts per horsepower, uh, and it was 10 to 15 amps, that comes out to be about uh, 5 or 6 horsepower. But those motors were very inefficient compared to the brushless motors we have today. And so we're not going to need nearly that. So that's what I want to do is replace the that motor that I showed you, that stepper motor, uh, get rid of that, or maybe put a, a another reduction on it. Uh, we'll probably need another reducer on it, but uh, not that first worm, worm gear. We'll go directly and turn the main worm gear, and we'll be able to slew and track and do whatever. And that Westinghouse motor that you just showed us. That, uh, yeah, that thing. Is that on a boat or on the telescope? That's on the telescope. Okay. How big is that? Uh, let's see. I should have put a quarter. <laughs> I'm guessing it's about uh, 24 inches in diameter. Yeah. It's inside the pillar. You climb yes. up the spiral staircase and go in a door, and it's in the same like little room where originally the weight-driven governor, gigantic weight-driven governor for the sidereal tracking, was located. This is this tucked in the back of the room, and of course, it's it's gigantic and amazing. Yes, thanks, uh, John. Um, hey, John. Uh, since we have you, when did they put the stepper motor on? Do you know? Man, um. I might have put it on. Um, <laughs> I yeah. wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, um, because it, it, I, I, I did a fair bit of work on earlier incarnations of the uh, of sidereal tracking, and um, but it was in the early, very early '90s, and it's I, I, I fear that um, um, I, it's hard for me to remember. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because but I certainly I I made changes uh, to the motor, and there were earlier incarnations, but the uh, a lot of 
a lot of what you were showing in the pictures was a, a, a very familiar hardware to me. From I know. Early days. I, I knew yeah. that. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm really glad you're here. Well, I certainly look forward to speaking with you about this um, in the future. It's uh, yes. of course it because it's um, it's uh, close to obviously close to many of our hearts. It's simply so cool. Yes. Yes. What? How long do you operate the conversion? Oh, um, um, somebody asked here. Uh, Joe asked, "How long did that uh, wait clock drive uh, run the telescope tr or track the telescope?" That's a very good question because it astonishes me that they physically removed the the gigantic governor mechanism from the room that's like three quarters of the way up the iron pillar inside the pillar. Um, it would have been a lot of work taking that out. Maybe it facilitated access to these motors here, uh, having the clock mechanism out of the way. That might have been the justification for getting rid of it. But I was always mystified why that big clock mechanism was not in storage somewhere in the building because it was not and it's a great mystery what became of it maybe somewhere buried in the director's reports is a clue to what happened to the mechanism but it was such a cool mechanism it's not something you'd want to recklessly throw out and i i again i don't know how soon uh, they got rid of it because interestingly the weight driven governor for say the Mount Wilson 100 inch continued to be used um, really uh, right up until uh, Carnegie um, uh, shut Mount Wilson down in the early 1980s. Uh, and it had a reputation for working really well uh, for the 100 inch. So, um, so I just don't know when uh, the the weight drive was retired at Yerkes, I wish I did. Yeah, um, so that's uh, interesting. Now, um, I was there with, um, I, I can't think of his name uh, right now, so, um, that we went way down, uh, you know, where the, where those, that huge motor is that raises and lowers the floor. Yeah, and down, cabinet, yeah. There's a cabinet there, and um, he told me, and we opened it up and looked, and there's a bunch of gears, and I have a picture of it. I'll send it to you. Yeah, I know that. I know I can visualize it because those have been sitting there a long time, and but there would have been so much more to the mechanism right. as well. But and, he said he told me that those were the gears for the clock drive. So the, I guess they have the gears, and and you know we have some drawings, some original drawings still. So yeah, it, it's possible somebody could could. Uh... Yeah, was that Ed Struble? Was this a guy who had previously worked there, Ed Struble? Maybe he showed you those gears. Do it. Is everybody familiar with the dev dev? Yes, that was Ed. Yeah, thank you. Yes, he was there when we went there. Uh, this uh, uh, when we went there in June, he was there. He was one yeah. of the people. Good. He was really great. Okay. And uh, I know you, John, I know you recognize this because you did it a, a long time ago. No, I, I yeah, I, I worked on these, but I, I don't take credit for installing this okay. improvisation. But these um, um, uh, these guns uh, took the place of the manual clamps. Uh, so they engaged and disengaged the clamps built into both of the tangent arms. Yes. And they, yeah. And they work. Uh, uh, I don't know how long ago they were installed. Do you, uh, John? I I actually think they might have been installed um, back in the 1960s when there was a major, major uh, uh, re-engineering. I hesitated to say upgrade, but there was a re-engineering <laughs> re of the Yerkes telescope um, when a fellow named uh, Van Eltena was on the staff, he was an astrometrist who ended up not staying on the University of Chicago faculty, but he went on to Yale. But a great deal of modernization was done to the Yerkes telescope. 
um, in in this period, and it was in my view it was controversial because people would tend to throw out a lot of the earlier manual uh, ways of controlling things, maybe a little bit too recklessly. And these guns uh, were very powerful, and they tended to possibly to damage the uh, mechanical clamps that are internal to the uh, tangent arms. And I don't mean to go getting lost in the weeds of, of the telescope details, but there's a lot of history here, and I fear that the new people at Yerkes don't necessarily know as much about the history of, of these changes as perhaps they should in the ongoing decision-making process. So I hope to help however I can. Uh, yes, I, you will, you'll, you'll be a big help. Uh, um, uh, what was I going to say about this? So these are, uh, what do they call these things? Uh, not jackhammers or they're, they're like, yeah, what they're like for impact, impact, impact guns. guns. Yeah. yeah. Impact wrenches. And yeah. So you're right. It, yeah. it, it, it really bangs it. And plus it's really loud. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're off now. That's okay, called. They're on now. Turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> on. That's called distur disturbing the peace. <laughs> what, what, what am I exactly looking at? Well, what that that turns a, a big. Uh, probably John can explain it better. Yeah, but, I'll, I'll 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 try. So so the telescope has um, manual clamps to basically engage to to to. Um, clamp um, the uh, telescope to the moving uh, polar axle, for example. You could originally, you know, you could you could move this telescope by hand and you'd unclamp it and grab hold of the eye end, you know, and you can walk it around and you can set it and point it purely by hand. And um, but if you want any of the slow motions to work or if you want the clock drive to work, there are not friction clutches on this telescope, but there are mechanical clutches that are maybe reminiscent of the mechanical locks that you might have on something like a Bridgeport mill uh, when you want to, you know, lock uh, various things on a Bridgeport. And so originally, those clamps, those locks, were all actuated from um, uh, hand wheels that were uh, geared and shafted down near the eye end of the telescope. And it was like really cool mechanical stuff. And, and you wouldn't like, like you wouldn't injure the internal uh, bronze blocks that are doing the clamping deep inside the mounting when you're tightening them by hand. But when you got that, when they decided to re-engineer it in the 1960s, they took a lot of this mechanism off the telescope tube. They lightened the telescope tube. It probably had less flexure as a function of that lightning. But when they put these stupid things on there, man, they were really hammering on the internal bronze blocks. And uh, they have had to take the whole thing apart once or twice to repair damage deep inside uh, the mounting. And the, there's a machinist retired in Williams Bay who actually was present when some of this work was done. And he's the guy uh, they really ought to be talking to to understand what some of the problems are inside. It's pretty easy. Um, John, so I, I have an idea to replace this uh, with a, a brushless motor that has a reducer on it and then use software and, and use a current sense to, to know exactly when it is. And so we don't do this hammering crap so uh, yeah and they would be quiet too yeah no they're you're you're on my end it did the film did not uh uh fully testify to the noise these things make uh, that, you yeah. know at, yeah and i mean this thing was still when i began started on the staff there in late 1990 they were still taking parallax plates and things uh, with this telescope and um that was still very much in use as a photographic telescope and man like late at night you know the shutters open uh the observer who is who is actually a guy from finland who had previously been some kind of um 
a merchant marine captain or something, he'd be up there and you'd hear these these guns go off. <laughs> uh, anyway, I forgive my I, 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 I'll, I'll stifle myself, but you're bringing up interesting memories. But uh, well, well, John's right about that. It, it is it's an echo chamber in there, uh, and when these go, it really is. You know, you really should wear earplugs to protect your ears. It's yeah. that bad. <laughs> All right, uh, this is getting near the end. Um, this is a, a movie, and uh, you'll see Ralph Nye. I'm sure you know him. Oh, yeah. So that sound is the right ascension slowing, and we don't know where that noise is coming from, but it, that's noisy too. But that gear train is quite extensive, so uh, there it comes. That's one and a half degrees a second. I timed it. That's cool. That's a huge bonus. So I said, yeah, a lot of yeah the, uh, you know, this uh, engineering for the 1890s, absolutely marvelous, if you ask me. Let's uh, watch uh, Ralph walk by. I was just trying to look at the dial so I could time it, and he walked right in front at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> well, instead of the right assessment circle, it's more of a meridian cell. It goes uh, from zero, one, two, three, one way, and then zero, one, two, three. Right. Three. Yeah. So it's not an hour angle in that sense. Yeah. Uh, it is see. actually, well, it's an hour angle that go, measures relative to the meridian. The meridian is zero. And no yeah. matter how you, what side of the uh, pier the telescope is flipped on, uh, it reads, it'll, it'll work. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. It's it's it works surprisingly well. Yeah, that's uh my the first early versions of um, SciTech EXE did it the same way until I got yelled at by somebody saying that's not how everybody does it. So, <laughs> uh, so these these are some of the existing controls that they did in the sixties, I think. Exactly. And this is a. Uh... <laughs> you know when you're when we're there. Uh, uh, with this cardboard thing of Einstein was, and I, I, if I'm in there working, and then I look up, who's that? You know, <laughs> Einstein with the That's a good yeah. one. Uh, this is a, this is a me. That's Einstein. I forget. <laughs> I forget uh, Amanda's daughter's name. Um, that's uh, uh, Vivian Hetty. Vivian, thank you. That's Ed um, uh, Strubel, and this is. Um, uh ralph nye from uh uh did well yes he he completely rebuilt a yeah. a, a wonderful telescope in low at lowell okay oh, cool yeah. no so questions when, when will you know i don't know um i haven't talked to amanda since uh we got it all working uh with the step and direction controller and uh so i'm i'm just patiently waiting I'm glad it's not right now. We're kind of busy, so. That's pretty cool to be glued into something that historical. I, I really hope we get it because it, you know, that's one of the reasons too, you know. Uh, well, I hope you do because maybe next year we could have the workshop there and the, the yeah. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've I've looked at the, the trapezium in, in this telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And this is just in for art. I know John knows this guy. He's my neighbor. Yep. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he, 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 uh, I'll just uh, make some quick comments that my Eric Toops, um, who's an electrical engineer by training, but very interested in optics and solar observing, mm -hmm. he discovered this telescope in a New Mexico junkyard lying in the dirt in, in completely disassembled as a big pile of parts that had been literally dumped there by a dump truck. He was able to buy the whole thing for 40 cents a pound. The optical tube assembly had not been um, uh, taken apart. It was a 24-inch um, F4 with an optical window in front. He reassembled it and with the, with the help of Dan's control system, the first night they turned the control system on and got a, a pointing model, um, uh, Eric was able to track satellites 
with that instrument, which he has named Eagle because it looks like an eagle land, the eagle lander on the moon. So that's a fabulous story. And I hope uh, Eric uh, shares it at, at, with this group some future year. Oh, no. <laughs> it's amazing. You know where it came good. from? Yes. Uh, there. Oh, good, good. That pick. That's that's what the up uh, well, there. That's what the telescope looked like before Eric got his hands on it. No exaggeration. He rebuilt the DC mo the, the 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 servo motors, um, and it was absolutely astonishing what he accomplished to make it. And it works. So and there's Dan's control system making it real. And yeah, yeah. that's Amazing. another force oh, too. And then uh, this is the first light image. Of the supernova. Yes. Right. Uh, I think it's right here. Yeah. I think so. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. We're very proud to have Eric in the neighborhood here. Yeah. Yeah, good job. Uh, he bought a school. <laughs> he lives in a school. <laughs> Unbelievable. Continuing education. Did we go over? Uh, not really. Few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's see. I'm going to log out of here if I can figure out how. Might need some help. Stop sharing your screen. That was good, Dan. Yes. That was fun. <laughs> okay, Zoom meeting. How do I get out of this? Please. Okay. Anybody there? Anybody there? Yeah, we're here. Okay. Ready for me to start? Uh, just just one moment, please. Dan's going to do a little show and tell. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, my, I, for some reason I can't get on full screen, but you'll be able to see okay. right in here. Can you help us do full screen <laughs> for, for Howard? It'll be a lot better. Well, I mean, I, I'm selected to be full screen. Okay. 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 Let's see, where does this So if you remember that 3D drawing of the encoder, this is a block of wood that we did for testing our CNC, and it worked fine. So you can see the little encoder ring in there, the bearing at the bottom. Here's the bearing at the top uh, for the lid. Oh, come on there and they go together you can see the little ridge on there the with radiuses that goes on there it's sort of like that <sighs> and then this is a uh, one of them that we did daniel did finish uh but it just needs a plate and we need to drill the holes that's for the radio telescopes and, yeah. Okay, now we're going to the JMI. That's uh, one of the reducers. We bought six of them and only need two. This is uh, aluminum. We just had a water jet because we could do it a lot cheaper than them. That's that part that he 3 depended for the test. And this is the boomerang. So I'm going to test it right now, see if it comes back. Here we go. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look out, Grace. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Dan. And um, uh, next up is uh, Bruce Howard. He's his talk is uh, about twenty-four inch Altaz Casagrain. And um, I'll let him share his screen. You should be able to do so now. Oh, I see Russ has joined uh, joined us. That's good. Does everybody see my screen? Uh, now we do, yes. Okay, good. 
So uh, let me get to the first slide here. Yeah. Today I'm going to talk briefly about my 24-inch cast grain that I built over the last years and put into operation a couple of years ago. It's a lot different than some of the telescopes I saw at the presentation last year in that it makes no pretension about being mobile. It's big and heavy, it weighs about 1,100 pounds. And it shoot hoard into this 10.5 foot, 12.5 uh, foot ash dome here. And uh, in this picture, it's actually at work. I turned the lights up just briefly to take this picture. And uh, you can see the basics of it is an Aldaz design with an open truss and a fork type mount. I got some better pictures a little bit later on. And these are the things I'll touch on during this. The specifications of it, the design goal, construction, how it fits into the dome, and just a brief introduction to my SETI instruments and ancillary equipment, which are all homemade. And then I'm converting it to direct drive motors at this time. They're once done and once uh, under construction. And hopefully with a little help from Dan, I'll, I'll get that going later this year. Here's some general views of it here. This is uh, the back plate here with one of the two instruments that I use. It's bolted to the back plate. It's solid to the back plate because the focus is done electrically by moving the secondary mirror. And uh, you, you can see the general construction of it, of it here. These uh, boxes in the back on the wall there, this one has the uh, side reel tech drive and one of the others has some of the ancillary electronics that work with these instruments. And then there's another box, dome control. The dome control is pretty important because the width of the slot is only slightly bigger than the mirror. So it has to be within a, a degree or so in order not to do any vignetting. And then this is a, a, the uh, primary mirror mount. And I got some better pictures of that later on. This 24-inch cast grain is sort of fast for a traditional cast grain. It's F12, which works fine for me because I do all the science with the principal ray. It probably wouldn't be too effective for a wide imaging. The, the coma off axis becomes pretty severe, but it works fine for me. The uh, Originally, when I started in this telescope, I got a quote for a custom 24-inch mirror and, and uh, cast grain set, and it was prohibitively costly. But fortunately, the, the optician had a 24-inch mirror that he made for another customer, and it fell through. And he was able to perforate that, refigure it, and make the secondary at this F12 system for a much more modest cost, which made this project possible. So it's again, it's a 24-inch mirror. It's F3-4 in the primary. Uh, the secondary is six and a half inch diameter. Even at F12, the focal length is real long, 288 inch. It's so Aldaz telescope open truss with an 18 point uh, Whipple tree type mount. The focus is 16 inches in back of the plate, which gives me plenty of room to put the instruments there. And it's 28 arc seconds per millimeter on the scale. The drive right now is, a, is more of a traditional system with worm gear and servo motors. Like I said, that's gonna be replaced here this winter, this spring maybe. And the focus is on a motorized mirror, which is really required because the instrument package is relatively heavy and it would not be possible to hang it from a focuser on the back plate. This works much, much better. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's heavy. It weighs about uh, between 1050 and 1100 pounds. Here's an overall view of the machine. Starting at the bottom, this is an azimuth drive, which uh, a portion, a matter of fact, the majority of it is actually below the observing floor, which is itself is about three feet off of the ground. And it has, uh, right here is the main bearing package, which is massive taper roller bearings back to back and then preloaded to remove play. There, there is no like plate and balls or anything. Like all the load and the azimuth axis is taken by roller bearings. And down right here, this is where the uh, Renishaw encoder is, right, right close to the fork. It's uh, it was one one million two hundred thousand counts. Now it's thirty million counts, which will work well with the uh, direct drive. And then down here is a traditional worm drive that I'll, I have some detailed drawings of it. The, the fork and the main tub here are constructed out of uh, eighth inch cold finished steel 
and then reinforced with angles and square tubing to stiffen it up and raise the natural frequency. The, the same thing for here, the tub contains the mirror mount and the mounting plates for the truss. All these things were fabricated by welding and then sent out and had them machined to where they'd all be dead square and parallel with one another. You can see a little bit of my instrument package here. It actually passes through the bottom, not really necessary, but it does. The altitude drive, same thing, a 16 inch worm gear with a Renishaw encoder. There's a, a one of the Pittman stepper motors, then there's a three to one belt and then 360 to one on the teeth. Yeah, Dan has a question for you. Excuse yeah. me? Dan has a question. Oh, okay. Hey, hey Bruce, uh, are those the same encoders that you used before and they're incremental? They're incremental encoders, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. I wish I had those other ones, the ones that are, uh, what are they, 60 million? And then they, they remember where they are, they're absolute encoders. Yeah. Um, well, we'll talk about that later, Bruce. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm going to definitely need some help getting that Force 1500 tuned up to drive these things, that's for sure. In the top here, we got the truss tubes. These are chromoly tubing with a thin wall. I, I like the steel tubing because the CTE is uh, half of what aluminum is. And then up at the top, this is an octagon ring fabricated from uh, thin walled steel tubing also. And here's the focus mechanism. I have a much more detailed picture of that later. And these plates are steel too. I didn't want to make them out of aluminum. Here again, the coefficient of expansion, I like for it to be the same, keep some tension on this. Here's some of the methods of fabrication. This is the fork being built. I had these side plates cut at a, a fabrication shop. I guess they uh, used a plasma cutter to do these. They're eighth inch steel. And then I built this table with double layer of three quarter inch fiber board, which is real flat. And you can see I put holes in it so I could clamp this down and measure and make this exactly what I wanted. Then I tack welded it all together and then raised it up and, and completed the welding on it. There's miles of Hilly Arc welding in this fork and also in the a tub assembly too. Then after this was all welded up, then an eighth inch steel plate was on the inside and outside to complete the fork. This is a view of where the, the main tub, you can't see the mirror right now because of these safety covers are closed. They're made of quarter inch plastic and they have a little magnet on it. When you open them up, they, uh, they register against the truss. Here you can see the, the entire structure it, it comes within inches of the top of the dome. It really is a shoehorn fit into the dome. That's how all these things were made. And here's the mirror mount. Or, originally, when I started on this project, this was going to be a fork mounted equatorial. That's why it's. if it was only uh, Aldaz, it probably I would have done the radial support a little bit different. But you can see it's a standard uh, type 18-point uh, mount. And uh, these pivot on a steel pin and then it's Teflon bushings in here. So it's completely free in, in all axes of motion. The radial supports here, this, this internal hexagon ring is machined out of aluminum. And then it's connected to the actual uh, clamps out here with these rods. And these are made of invar, which is a nickel alloy with a zero coefficient of expansion. And if you add up all these things, it more or less equals the expansion of a mirror. So I can keep these things pretty tight. And even with a large uh, yearly change in temperature, keep the gap pretty small here. The, the mirror itself had a, had a relatively small hole in the perforation. So the baffle tube had to be reduced it's, uh, I think, three inches here or more, three and a half, and then it's reduced down, and it goes through and into the back plate, and it can be independently collimated in a mirror with a spring-loaded assembly. Here, here's some details here of the uh, upper section. This, uh, this ring fabricated from steel tubing. All these parts, after they were fabricated, they were machined flat and then a bead blasted and painted at an automotive shop. So it's a pretty durable paint job on here. Same thing with the tubing here. This is the mechanism that focuses it in a little bit bigger detail here. 
I have a, a detailed drawing coming up, but basically it uses a stepper motor, a ball screw, and then a bunch of rollers that guide it so that it's free in the Z axis, but absolutely constrained in the X and Y axis. And this will allow it to focus with, even with a 600 power eyepiece, you'll see no shift whatsoever. A star just blooms, goes back down to about as sharp as it'll get, and then blooms again on the other side of focus. And these are some details of it. It's got limit switches to prevent over travel. Here's the focus mechanism. This was generation two, and the one in the machine is generation three, but there's very, very little difference. See the motors up top driving this ball screw. And uh, there's two there's sets of four rollers at two different elevations. On each elevation, two rollers are fixed. And then 90 degrees to them, there's a pivot roller. That's what this die spring does. It rotates around this pin and it pushes the roller up against the cylinder here. The cylinder has been machined with four flats and that are precision ground. So that's what locks it in to the X, X and Y axis. And then of course it's free to move in the Z. It has 20 millimeters of travel, although that's only a third of that is actually needed. And then down here, we've got the secondary mirror. And it's collimated with die springs and nuts. There's three die springs, 180 to 120 degrees apart, and then brass nuts here. These are, are really potent springs, so they don't. there's no locking mechanism. You just tighten and loosen one at a time and uh, to, to achieve the collimation. Here's the existing drive mechanism. Got the Pittman motor. Got a three to one ratio on a, on a tooth belt coming up here. The worm gear is this entire assembly right here, the worm gear, the motor and so forth. It pivots on this bearing over here and you've got a release handle. It's kind of like a gear shift on a car. And this entire mechanism will pivot and it releases the worm from the worm gear to, uh, to do the balancing. That's what this lever here is for. This is a, the same motor I think that lots of the SciTech installations use. It's the 10 to 1 ratio. Here's a, here's a detailed picture of how the existing drive works. This is what I was describing before. It pivots here, and then this Teflon block has a tongue and groove to lock this side up, make it stiff. And then this release handle will pull this entire mechanism down and uh, and that uh, allows it to be focused. I put a plexiglass cover over to keep the dust off of it as, as much as possible. This little uh, spring here maintains this in the lock position until you push it over and then you can pull that down, release it, torsion spring. Here's how it all fits in the dome. As you open it, the grate is right about here. You open the door and go up these stairs. This is the actual observing deck. As I was mentioning before, the bulk of the azimuth drive is uh, under underneath the floor here. The azimuth drive bolts up to this couple yards of concrete here, goes down on the ground, gives us a really, really solid mount. And uh, it also, also having the floor here puts the instrument package at a convenient height. No, no ladder or anything is needed. So that the double advantage of having the floor off of the ground. And you can see in this picture how close it is. It's just a few inches away. Just fits in this dome. Shoehorned in there. Oops. Here's the azimuth drive over here. This, this is the section that bolts up to the... This, this is the mating part for, for the fork. And you can see the encoder here and the reed, the reed head here. And uh, this is all made of aluminum plate that's been anodized. And down here is the mechanism. It's very similar to the one on the altitude drive. Just a few minor geometry differences to fit on here. And here I am. I'm lowering it down into the floor. And these bolts are the ones that are coming out of the concrete pier. And then once I got it down there, I used a machinist level to make it, uh, make it as flat as possible. And here, this is a crane. These pieces were so heavy that it was not possible for me to manhandle them into the dome. So I, I had this crane come out. The guy was real good. He dropped all these pieces down through the hole. It was well worth the 300 bucks he charged me to save all these parts from destruction. 
I was very pleased with that. This is a couple of years ago. As a matter of fact, two years this month that the uh, I put it all together. Here's the here's the mirror and the mirror mount and the installation technique. The, the mirror is sitting. This is this permanent mount in the back plate here, and it's sitting on this little cart with four casters. And this is a, a temporary fabrication from plywood and two by fours. And once I get it on there, I slide it underneath. And then with these all threads, it gets jacked up into the into the final housing and tightened up. There's, I think, 18 bolts that hold the back plate up against the uh, main portion of the tub. The pointing and tracking accuracy, because it's so heavy duty, it's pretty good. This is a five second, a five arc second circle in here. And almost all the stars are in that. The RMS error is less than three arc seconds, and these are all over the sky. Yeah. This is, I'm going to talk just briefly about my primary instrument. And uh, it's a heavy, heavy instrument. Oops, went too far. This is the overall view of it and the interior of it. This device uses two photomultiplier tubes. The incoming beam comes in, hits this beam splitter, 50% or less losses, but go to one tube and 50% come down to this other tube. And this whole thing works on the premise that a laser signal would activate both of them simultaneously where the starlight alone, the photon arrival rate is slow enough to where only one tube would be tripped at a time. And this mirror is on a stepper motor to where I can uh, observe it through this eyepiece, which I don't do much anymore because I have this camera. But in previous iterations, I, I use this to target it. And then this mirror stepper motor, this stepper motor pulls this mirror out of the way. And then the beam goes into the detection technology. This picture here, this device is over here. And it moves several different aperture sizes into the optical beam. There's a, 10 arc seconds, 20 and I think 40 and then wide open. So depending on the scene, I can select the appropriate aperture. A lot of this is similar to what photometry was like in the photomultiplier day. Of course, that's been almost totally replaced with uh, CCD photometry. And uh, down here is a custom circuit that I built to, to it analyzes all this and reports it to a computer. And then this preview, here, here's a regular camera, commercial CCD camera. And then this device here is similar to this. It's a motorized mirror that de deflects the beam up into here. And then it, it uh, shows up on a computer screen with a cross here. And that's really how I, when I move it from star to star, how I ensure that it's, uh, it's uh, found the right star and tracking properly. It doesn't have a big view, eight arc minutes, but that's that's plenty since the stars are usually within arc seconds of the command. This has a separate focus mechanism independent of the main focus mechanism, and that's this over here. And it works like the main focus. There's a stepper motor, a lead screw, and, and ball slides here that move the camera up and down over a, a very short range. And this is the other component in my uh, in the instrument section. This is a filter wheel. It's not much different than a commercial one, but I made it much heavier duty because it supports the weight of those heavy instruments. It has neutral density filters in here because those uh, PMTs, photomultiplier tube, are easily swamped by a bright star. Anything brighter than about magnitude eight has to have some attenuation put in it. So. These filters go from 50% pass band down to 1%, and I can dial them in. The stepper motor turns this gear, and then this uh, hall sensor produces a start position, and then it just counts pulses as, as it commanded. And here's here's the uh, dashboard on, the, on my primary computer. This, of course, is a side rail technology arrangement up here. And then this is a view of my CCD camera with the crosshair in the middle. And these are softwares that I've written to uh, control the instrument. This is the controls the instrument package. And uh, it, it has a star selection and the high voltages for the photomultiplier tubes. 
the uh, actual count right here, some uh, time here. And this, this section here controls the neutral density filters and this focuses it. This down, this down here is uh, for the dome synchronization. As I had mentioned before, the, the width of the slot and the mirror size are not that much different. So it's important that it stays synchronized. The uh, Ash Dome came with a, just a conventional half horsepower induction motor and a reversing switch. It's kind of, kind of crude, it moves too quick. I took that motor off and put an AC servo motor and an encoder on it and a home switch. So now it'll synchronize. You, you push one of these buttons to initialize the dome, it goes to a home position. And then from there on, the encoder provides the information about where the dome's at. This software hooks up through ASCOM to the SciTech and extracts the azimuth. And then it compares it with the desired position and operates the servo motor to uh, keep the dome within 0.4 degrees of, of where the telescope is pointing. In this application, all it does is move the primary focus. And as I mentioned before, I'm building the direct drive motors. I'm going to install them, hopefully, maybe in December or January. They use uh, Dan's Force 1500 controller. One's done, not tested, or done, and the other is in an earlier stage of construction. You can see here, they, they probably look a lot like the ones you've seen before. There's 24 coils and 32 magnets. And there it is on the test stand. I'm getting close to trying to fire it up. I'm going to need some help from Dan to do that. And that's that's uh, that's really what I got. Any questions? Yeah, Dan has a bunch, I think. Yeah. Okay. question was... Uh, on your secondary, it looked like a Pitman on, in your 3D model. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a second that was a second generation. The newer one uses a stepper motor with an electric brake. The stepper motors are on all the time and get hot. So how it works is when you focus, it releases the brake, it moves the lead screw, and then the brake is released after that. Okay. Um, uh, my next question. Gosh, I should have written it down. Uh, I might think of it later on, but the, my last question is, do uh, you need a job? <laughs> <laughs> if I was a young guy, I would jump on it, believe me, because uh, it would be more interesting than the work I used to do, uh, make, designing pumps for uh, nuclear reactors. Sorry. You just hey, this is Jeff it. Bolden. I'm curious who did your optic work? Uh, Star Instruments. Oh, uh, Flagstaff? Well, he moved, the guy moved, I'm trying to think of his name, Jones, Paul Jones. Yep. He, he moved, I think he's retired now, but prior to that, he moved to North Georgia. Hmm. Maybe, maybe had family members there. I bought a 16-inch mirror from him in like 95 or something, and I had used that telescope until this one was finished. And the mirror quality is on that 16-inch was really good. This one is good too, but it doesn't, uh, because it was so big, I had to make some compromises to keep the cost for what I could afford it. It's not made of low expansion glass. The 16 inch was made of Astro Cetol, which was a, a Russian version of Zero Dur. And it, it, that, it, that is good to have the low expansion glass, but it's something I, I couldn't do on this one. Thank you. Yeah, Paul Jones uh, made the uh... 32 inch mirrors for the uh, Fairborn Observatory, our original uh, photometric telescopes when he was located in Flagstaff. I went and I picked my 16 inch mirror up at his works in Flagstaff. I guess I think it was in the 94 or something like that. And uh, he had a lot of really neat stuff there. He has the test equipment. The, the Cassegrain mirror would be very hard to home make. I bet Mel could no doubt make one, but it's a big job because you have to have a, a lot of test equipment. The secondary isn't, isn't spherical, and, and it takes a real expert to get that uh, to, to the right. Yeah, point. he made our mirrors for us back. He made our mirrors for us back in the... Uh, the 80s. He was just kind of getting started then. They were excellent quality and very reasonably priced. Yeah. 
and I, I, he's, he was a very good optician. I, I think he's retired now, but I, I could be wrong about that. I have another question. I remembered my question that I forgot. Um, you mentioned that the time delay for the laser to the op uh, their star light was different, and that's probably because of the position of the planet. And it could be before or after, depending on where it is in its orbit, or simultaneously. Is that right? Well, the the way that that detection works, it's looking for a, a a laser signal, and the idea of it is that a laser could out outshine the sun for a very brief time. And lasers exist right now. They use them in the fusion research that could outshine our sun by four to four orders of magnitude. Now, of course, it's at one spectral line and for picoseconds. So the way that instrument is designed, if you're looking at a 10th magnitude star, you get about a million counts, which is a one microsecond between photons. Uh, they're not regularly spaced because of the quantum stuff, but so one microsecond apart, and this thing is looking for five nanosecond arrival. So it, you'd never see that unless there's a glitch or something. One goes, one two fires, the next two fires, not coincident. If that big, huge group of photons from that laser arrived, they would be spaced so close that within that five nanosecond window, that the, both of those tubes would trip, and that would be called a coincident, uh, a, a coincident arrival. That's what that circuit board looks for. It, uh, it has super fast amplifiers. They write 1500 volts per microsecond and they, uh, and they go into a comparator. So if uh, it's approximately five nanosecond, if it comes in within that time frame, both of those tubes will trip and then it'll show up on the dashboard as a coincident arrival. That's, that's the principle behind that camera. Okay, um, I'll have to think on that or maybe I'll discuss it with you later. But, uh... Uh, yeah. Have you had any coincidence? Uh, yeah, I've had I've, a few, but they if they don't repeat, then I can't can't say much about them. My software includes a, an algorithm that looks for repetition, and that they would have to repeat because the power company could turn the generator on, lightning, airplane go by. There's a lot of potential causes for one event, so it would have to be more than one event. It would have to be. Uh, a, pattern of them in order to say that that was something important. And that happened one time and I, I never repeated and I, I thought maybe it was something with the airplane strobe light or something, but it was exciting when it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll bet. Uh, what size of uh, intelligence are you <laughs> Could could you hear that question? No, I no I couldn't. I'm sorry. What optical signs are you looking for with these telescopes? I uh, it's the, the 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 whole idea of it is this optical setting looking for a trans a, a transmission from an intelligent society. Uh, it's you've heard of course a lot about the radio setting, which is the big thing. This is something different. It's been done on the professional level some at the Lick Observatory. There was a team there in the past that did it with equipment, something like what I'm using. So that's what it's looking for is this a simultaneous arrival of a powerful laser signal, which would outshine the sun, which there the sun at the transmission location. That's the whole principle of it. Are so we... what I what what I do is I bring it to a potential star and I have a catalog from a, a habitable potentially habitable places and uh, I get it get it on there I turn it on I let it run for 10 minutes it does a, it does a scan the scan lasts 10 minutes 600 lines and each line is uh, about 900 milliseconds so there's a lot of scans and each scan looks for one of these arrivals and then the software keeps track of that and uh, I can go back to the software real quick. Up here, these these are the count rates, uh, raw count rates from the uh, two tubes. And then this one is the coincident count. And the reason it's showing some is if you look at this, it's all, any of these that end in an 11 are a test flasher. A, a signal from the uh, a GPS receiver, they have one a square wave that's coincident with a one second. A, a, the, the rising edge of it is within nanoseconds of the UTC second. 
And I wire that into my test circuit. So every one second, it'll, it, it goes into there and it counts by a hundred. So there's a hundred seconds between every one of these test pulses. And that, that tells me that the system is working as designed. The test pulse is very short, eight nanoseconds and very weak, just enough to trip the tube. So if this test signal comes in every hundred seconds, I know this system is working properly and would make a detection if there was anything to detect. That's, that's this section of the software up here. I turn the scan on here and it runs for 10 minutes uh, uh, anytime I want, really, but I usually run it for 10 minutes. And uh, they're, they're, they're made, this one was one that was interesting because there was a couple on here. All the 11s have to be dis disregarded because they're the test signal. But if it's not, it doesn't end in 011, then it was a coincident rival. And uh, never, this one never repeated, unfortunately, but it, it was interesting. Do you know the guy down in Panama? Yes, uh, Ben, he's not active any longer. His, his health and his health of his wife deteriorated and, and he gave it up. He actually donated the telescope to the uh, University of Panama. And uh, he, he gave me, he, he gave them my name in case they had some, I made a lot of it, but, but nobody ever, I never had any contact with him. So uh, I worked with him a few times because uh, he had a servo two, I believe. And I looked at a picture of his mountain. I thought it was an alt alt mount. And no, it's just he lives near the equator. No. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think he's seven or eight degrees north. Yeah. So it was kind of an unusual telescope. When I first met him, it had a, a friction drive with, with wood discs on it. And it, it wasn't getting particularly good results, especially with the humidity down there. So we built him a new uh, new friction drive with aluminum wheels and uh, a, a much better way to put pressure on the wheel. and. Uh, and we changed it to your controllers and stuff. And he was getting pretty, it was getting pretty good results at the end. It didn't have any encoders, so there was a limit to how close it was going to get. It was, it was everything he needed. Um, I, I was one, really sorry to see that. Yeah. Uh, I had another question. Um, uh, you've obviously written a lot of software. I was wondering what language you use. Most of that is either Visual C or Visual Basic. Okay. The reason, uh, none of that stuff is fast enough for real-time control, but what it does mostly is uh, over in the electronic boxes, there's these data acquisition modules and the actual work is done inside those modules. So this doesn't have to, I mean, there's no interrupts in this window 10 system. So uh, it, it can't really do any kind of precise control of anything, but like your system, that's done somewhere else, and this software is just the interface to it. Right. Okay, what's sort of a general question? It's but, very hard to see. Oh. So just, is your searching weather related or clear sky related? Or, I mean, are you searching all the time? No, it, uh, I don't have to have super good seeing or anything because it works on the principal ray and uh, the focus isn't even very important as long as all the energy ends up on the photocathode of the tubes. I don't, I don't need to have a razor sharp image. So it, it's, not as, it's not anywhere near as weather dependent as like when you want to gonna do the deep sky imaging and you want the scene to be a couple of arc seconds or better. Here, here in, I live in the Santa Fe, New Mexico area. We have good skies. They're not all, the scene's not always great, but the visibility is, is good. Right this time of the year, it's pretty much clear all the time. But the scene is not always good. It's, it's, I would say it was five arc seconds or so. It's not super good. So when are we going to see the CNN news? Uh... <laughs> Astronomer finds <laughs> intelligent life beyond our galaxy. <laughs> well, this that, it's a, it's it's a long it's a long long shot thing with a big huge payoff. Yeah. I've been working on it for like ten ten years now or so. Each time when I get one generation of camera done, then I start thinking about the next. Kind of like what I guess Mel does with his mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> 
start with your instruments um, on all the time, like trying to detect? No, no, I, I, it's not remote control. The dome's out in the backyard. So I'm, I'm in a dome when it's running. I run one star for 10 minutes. I, at the beginning of an evening, I look and I see right down five or six stars in one area of the sky. And then I just go from one to the next and let it scan for 10 minutes and move to the next and scan it for 10 minutes. So no, it's not out there running, running all the time. It runs only when, when I'm in there. It doesn't work in the daytime. It has to have dark and minimal clouds. It's optical. Okay. Yeah. When it's dark and when it's running. Yeah. Any plans to turn it into a robotic scope? No, no, not not right now. I I want to get this motor project done, and then I've I've been working on a new piece of equipment to look for the polarization vector of starlight, and I I'm working on that. So n no, not really. It's right out in the backyard, and I'd rather be sitting in there when it's running anyway, in case something goes wrong. <laughs> it, it runs pretty well now. I've got a lot of the bugs worked out of it. it I, I usually go through the whole night without having to do anything. Early on, of course, there was some issues, but it, it runs really smooth now. All the equipment is homemade, basically, except for the CCD camera. What, what what's your polarized polarization uh, unit based on? It's it has, uh, unfortunately, the picture is very small, but it's shown on the back of one of these pictures here. I'll find it. This, uh, this one here. This one here. It has two two boxes to it. This one has a photomultiplier tube and a power supply, and then this one has rotating polarization filters. So. Uh, if the starlight was polarized, it rotates in at 90 degrees and it scans and then looks for the diminishment of light from that polarized beam. And then in that same filter wheel, I showed uh, somewhere here, this. I have one wheel that's for the general, my general search with the neutral density filter. And then I have another one with some passband filters for la common laser frequencies. Uh, and uh, I can rotate that in and see if there's a signal that's polarized or not. It's, 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 it's in development, but it's a long way from being where I want it to be. That's what I'm working on right now in addition to these motors. The motors, they look easy to build, but I, my experience was that they weren't. The coils took quite a bit of time to get them to look the way I wanted them to. Okay. Any more questions? Any questions, Zoomies out there? No? All right. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Really Thank, you. Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. So let's see here. We'll uh, stop the screen share. And I see Russ is here. So uh, a suggestion for rejuggling our schedule. If, if you're ready to go, Russ, would oh, you? Yeah. You go. Okay. So let's let's go ahead and put you on, and then Joe can go after after lunch, and then we'll just continue on. With the rest of the schedule. Yeah, so, and I won't take too long. Mine's not a real long grieving. Okay, so you you should be able to okay, share so the screen at any time. Okay. Again, does that show up okay? Yes, it does. Okay. So uh, the uh, first thing I want to do is is so we uh, we moved. From California to Arizona a couple years ago, and I built a. Um, uh, we moved to be with Cheryl's uh, daughter, and so in one end of uh, her daughter's house, we built a granny quarters and added a little kitchenette and a little bathroom and an out back door patio and sliding door. And in the backyard, of course, there's an observatory, and so it's not very large; it's about eight foot square. And it has a uh, tilt off roof. So you can kind of see the roof slanting there. And, um, and it's counterweighted. 
and uh, not in this picture, added since this picture is a, uh, a linear uh, jack screw that uh, opens and closes the roof. And so that's pretty convenient. The, uh, uh, when I first brought it there, it was worm gears. That's what I was using in California, but uh, Dan very kindly built um, uh, a, a, a no, you're breaking the enough. We didn't hear the last there couple there of seconds. The shot. Okay, uh, is that better? Yes. Okay, let me move the computer over here. The uh, yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, Dan, uh, uh built the coils and the motor and so forth. Uh, when we first tried it out, uh, it worked real good in RA, but it would uh, you couldn't turn the gain up very far in the in the deck. And uh, so we the uh, deck shaft was uh, uh, hollow tubing and a fairly thin wall. It was steel, but uh, so we uh, decided to replace it with a solid shaft. And Dan, as I remember, the uh, uh, you and Dave had a bet whether it would would work or not. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it it's it worked, and so um, Dave so, owes me a beer. That's right. You you do you bet a beer. <laughs> and uh, the main use for this telescope is going to be for it. It could do speckle interferometry, but I like to use larger apertures for speckle interferometry because we can get closer binaries with uh, shorter time periods. So the main use of this telescope is going to be for a time series photometry. Uh, primarily, uh, uh, Gaia has discovered a whole bunch of new um, eclipsing binaries, uh, thousands of them. And uh, their coverage, uh, typically for the uh, DR3 release, is kind of like between 80 and 200 or so. Uh, uh, um, observations just randomly spaced in time. And so if if it's a very more than two or three days, it, it, it means that the um, eclipse itself may just have three or four points. And so the, the idea of the use this telescope for follow-up is to, you, you know when the eclipse is going to be pretty fairly closely. And uh, so we, and then we'll just fill it in solid with points in at least uh, 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 two colors. So the uh, uh, filter wheels automated and uh, we use Dan's uh, uh, SciTech software. Uh, we're, we're just really great, very happy with it. And uh, at any rate, so that's all set up and uh, planned to uh, get going this coming spring. I'm leaving for Hawaii for the winter and in about another month here. And we've been working on, on the, well, I'll show you that next. So, so that's one project. And then the uh, next project is, uh, I'm teaching uh, astronomy research at the local community college. So uh, uh, Rachel Freed is on the faculty here and uh, remotely, and she teaches the introductory astronomy research. So they just do CCD uh, spec, uh, just CCD regular imaging of somewhat wide binaries. And um, and I do uh, uh, speckle interferometry. But at any rate, uh, we and so we wanted to have our own uh, uh, telescope uh, the original idea was to get a telescope and put it either at uh, Sierra Remote Observatory by Yosemite or down at the uh, uh, El Sas Observatory in uh, Chile. And uh, but, but when I even hinted that we might consider putting it on campus, the, the local... Uh, Powers that be, they went wild and says, "Oh, you got us would have access to it." And, you know, and the people in the town wanted to have an observatory. But anyway, to make a long story short, I decided, eh, "I'll uh, we'll, we'll 
we'll put it on campus. We knew it would be lots of work, but so where we're at is um, the Karis Foundation funded a half meter um, plane wave instrument telescope, uh, completely instrument. We've got um, a um, a nice uh, QHY 600 camera be behind a, uh, a straight through it. And we've got a Botter uh, three-part instrument selector. And so straight through goes essentially a wide field camera with a filter wheel. And then one of the other two ports goes off to the side to a, um, a Barlow and a camera and filter wheel for speckle interferometry and, and planetary imaging, that sort of thing. narrow field, uh, high speed sort of things. And then on the other side, it goes out to a um, spectrograph, the uh, ALPI spectrograph. So it's low resolution, but it's the one spectrograph that's been uh, successfully uh, automated by a number of, uh, of folks. And uh, so anyway, so that's the uh, telescope. It was ordered all uh, maybe eight, nine months ago, and it's would have been delivered, I think, a few weeks ago, but uh, Plane Wave Instruments having a little problem with uh, the glue holding their mirrors to <laughs> the telescope. <laughs> so anyway, they'll, they'll get it solved and it'll show up. And then uh, uh, we've uh, ordered a, we've put together a proposal for an, a 16 foot ash dome and total automation, all the weather sensors, seeing monitor, the, you know, the whole nine yards. So the, the first proposal for the telescope, it was $128,000. And then the uh, proposal for the dome and so forth, it was, it was $270,000. So it's quite a bit of money to have this all done. We have an expert from Tucson that has a company that they're into in telescope automation. And uh, anyway, this picture here, is a picture of the half meter plane wave instrument telescope, not at our place yet because we don't have the dome, and the 16 foot ash dome. Uh, and it's at the um, uh, King's Academy in uh, Jordan. So this is a telescope at, at, in, in uh, Jordan. Hopefully they aren't getting hit by rockets. <laughs> but at uh, any rate, the uh, so and it's so it's a lot like ours except and ours is on an equatorial wedge like this one is, but this one doesn't have, have much in the way of instruments. Ours is more completely instrumented. Okay, so this is kind of what our dome will look like. We it's actually on the campus up on a little hill, and it's going to have a, um, a platform surrounding it with a little wall so those people won't fall off. And, um, and we, we can set up our telescopes and like a small solar telescope and so forth out on this kind of wide ramp that goes around it. So, so that's kind of the second project that I've been working on is for the college. The uh, third project is we have, uh, there's a bunch, this is El Sauce Observatory. It's out in the uh, uh, Atacama Desert. It's really close to, um, CTIO and the 4.1 meter sort telescope, uh, almost within the seeing distance. And under one of these roll off roofs is a, um, a CDK uh, one meter telescope. And uh, so we've had time, we're starting our second year, but we have a full year of observations starting uh, last October. And uh, yeah, I can you still hear okay. Yes. Oh, okay, good. So starting last October, uh, every month we got a number of nights of uh, full moon. People didn't want near near the full moon, but it speckle works just fine, uh, full moon or not. And um, so we've gathered uh, a speckle interferometry on. Uh, hundreds of known binaries, most of them quite close, uh, kind of ranging from uh, uh, around uh, 0.1 arc seconds to 
uh, 0.5 or 0.6. So they're mainly ones that are closer than Gaia uh, can handle. Gaia doesn't do well once it gets below around six tenths of an arc second separation. It, it doesn't see them as two, two separate stars there. Pixels too large in the resolution, you know, the telescope isn't very, very large aperture. And uh, so there was a, um, uh, a lots of data, about four terabytes of data, uh, raw data, and got uploaded as it was taken to Google. It turns out it's very hard to get four terabytes off of, of a Google Drive <laughs> in Chile. Yeah. That actually took months. <laughs> and uh, so they they finally got it downloaded. We're reordering, renaming the files to get them so we access. So anyway, lots of work to make that data. And we're starting to uh, gather our second year. Some of these um, uh, systems, they're really short, short, just a few year period. And there'll be sizable uh, movements from one year to the next. And uh, the, the uh, finally, the, the other program that I've been working on. And so, oops, sorry about the, uh, <laughs> there we go. Any rate, the other program is uh, observations of Mount Wilson. So we've been going every, uh, summer in June to Mount Wilson right after the SAS meeting for several years. And so so there's me, there's Tom Smith. Uh, uh, that's Rachel Freed there. Uh, this is Paul McCudden. So Paul's been working very closely with us. He's uh, chair of the science department at uh, Colorado Mountain College and is really into uh, speckle and, and double stars. And our, our students meet with his students once a week and students in uh, India. Uh, the folks from India weren't able, they couldn't get their visas in time to, to make the Mount Wilson. And then, but uh, at the end of the table, uh, this is Leon, he's from Germany. He was a student of Calais at high school and he's now in college. And he does lots of the, programming and stuff for the one meter telescope in Chile. And then uh, this is Nick Hardy and Nick's from um, Belgium. And he wrote the, the Nina saw uh, a, a app that add on that goes to Nina that does that automated speckle interprompter. So it's the first time it's really been successfully uh, automated. And uh, uh, thanks to software by Nick, he's written other applications for Nina, including uh, their uh, exoplanet application. At any rate, so that's, and Mount Wilson, uh, we had three, San Diego had one night and we had three nights. Uh, the first night, uh, normal teething problems. We didn't get much observed the first night. The second night was better, but we realized we were spending lots of time ro rotating the dome back and forth and if they, just on 60 inch, 60 inch dome isn't very uh uh very speedy and so the third night what we did is we expanded the target list so uh uh the binaries the known binaries would usually pop up and be within the slit so we wouldn't have to move the slit or if they weren't quite in the slit we wouldn't have to move the uh the slit very far and uh so in rate uh, we observed uh, 50 binaries, known binaries, and the data got downloaded lots faster, and the Paul McCudden got the files sorted out, and we've automated the uh, first part of the reduction from the big files to what's called the BSP files. But anyway, it does all the fast Fourier transforms so far then, and it reduces the uh, size of the files by about a factor between 500 and 1,000. So now... So then they're easy to uh, to handle, and so I've been I've reduced by hand all the uh, fifty observations and been studying them, and uh, the uh, and I I did did it first manually with a, literally with a protractor and a ruler on the on the uh, printouts from the Naval Observatory showing the orbits. 
Uh, but uh, recently what I've been working on is uh, using Desmos. I don't know if any of you know, that, but Desmos is a, uh, it's an online graphing calculator. So it's kind of like the old HP calculators on the, on steroids. And it's, it's really, really nice. And, um, and so this is a, um, a, uh, one of the ones we observed. And if you, I don't know, if, can you, you see my cursor or does that not show? Yeah, we can see it. Howard, can you see my cursor? Yes, okay. we can see it really so, well. So all these, uh, oh, okay, good. Uh, so all these um, uh, green ones are, the green plus signs are visual observations. And then the uh, bright blue ones, these are speckle observations. And uh, and then the U.S. Naval Observatory plots, they don't have the most additional. So there was two more by Tocqueville-Bennon on the uh, 4.1 meter telescope. And this is our Mount Wilson Observatory observation from uh, 2023. And uh, anyway, and then I, made a new orbit that goes more carefully through these points. You can see this is clearly going off orbit. So the, you know, the orbits could be wider, the period's a little bit longer, that sort of thing. And so uh, here's a, the new orbit that I came in. And so this is just showing it going through. This is Tokovin and yeah, come on in. Oh, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. And goes through, and the uh, these Tocqueville observations, they're like this one here. It's off less than a milli arc second. <laughs> less, I mean, they are Tocqueville is he's superb. They were just super accurate. Our observation uh, was off about seven milli arc seconds. So I mean, it is really close. Of course, we were just using a one point five meter telescope, and these were. 4.1 meter telescope. At any rate, so that's uh, uh, what I've been up to. And the, uh, so uh, uh, it's keeping me busy. I'm giving, uh, also doing a flying aviation thing. I've kept up uh, instrument current. So about 83 still, still flying instrument approaches. And then I'm part own, owner of an airplane. And we're working with a, uh, city of Payson to expand the airport facilities and facilities at the college. So I was actually got hung up today working on a uh, presentation for the uh, city council as soon as I get back. So I'm sorry I missed some of the earlier talks. I did catch the Dan, I caught the end of your talk. Anyway, that's it. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Hmm. Okay. No. no All right. No. no well, it's really good to see you, Russ. First of all. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had me a little worried when you weren't. Uh, you didn't. Uh, weren't available first thing at uh, nine thirty. So. Um, yeah. It's real good to see you. And for those who don't know, um, Russ is he started this workshop. And, um, you know, without him pulling us together, God, it seems like 100 years ago now, Russ. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, I, it's 14 or 15, something like that. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, without Russ getting this going, we wouldn't be here today. So he, he found a real sweet spot, I think, in terms of um, a cross section of professional and amateur telescope making and you know we've just kind of run with it since then so as always thank you again russ yeah most welcome and i think it's good to point out i think the altas initiative was quite responsible in many ways for the uh, plane wave direct drive telescopes and their success with the uh cdk 700 and the, the one meter telescopes that's spreading around the planet so uh three cheers for the altas initiative and thanks howard for Keeping it going. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. We have a question for you.
great for supporting all these projects and everything, but I wonder if in the back of your mind, there's the next impossible dream. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I organized several uh, American Astronomical Society workshops on a small space telescopes. And so that, and we actually had a little workshop, if you remember, Howard, back, what, five years ago, remember, a couple mm -hmm. of the, uh, yeah. my Cal Poly students came up. And <laughs> oh, yeah, I and, remember. Uh, so that's kind of an impossible dream. And uh, I guess another dream, one that I'm working on is, is I'm trying to work with, uh, other community colleges, rural community colleges that don't have, you know, so we can do shared facilities and have shared classes. You know, the students are widely dispersed, so you have to make, get the classes for a, across a bunch of colleges in order to get a, a decent class and a specialty like uh, astronomy research. And, uh, and also that we can share facilities. So that idea of that half meter telescope that I showed you earlier is, not so much just for our college to use it, but for it to be shared with the other rural community colleges in Arizona and the uh, Southwest. So that's kind of kind of my two dreams. Let's take it an easy and why on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always a good dream. Yeah. Thanks, bro. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Dan, for hosting it again. That's great. Yay. It's in our new shop yeah, now, you know, we had to move. Uh, <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. You know, the last time we were here, we were on Cutter Circle. Uh, you remember that. You've been there several times. But we had, oh, to yes. move, we had to move our whole shop. So we're in the same neighborhood, but we've moved. He, he really means it. <laughs> yeah, it's really. He's not far. Like, if you can imagine. <laughs> you can hop, skip, and a jump away. So, um... We're going to turn this over now to Joe LaCour, who's going to give us a LIGO A plus upgrade. Um, but let's see, you want to do the, the first part without being yeah, recorded? Yeah, you keep it. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording um, briefly yeah, so, yeah. so um, we, can, we can do this Let's part. Put the first slide up real quick. All right, let's see. Okay, the first slide. It's just a little funny story that I might this not one? want the world to know. Okay, so this is the first slide. Just don't want to record it. Just remind you yeah. to start the recording. So, again. so LIGO. Okay, hold on. Hold on. This is the slide. This yeah. isn't, so, the, I need to screen share this, I think. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Before so, we can get going here, so I've been working with Altair, but anyway, oh, LIGO Observatory in the, um, I guess you could call it the assembly lab, where only the scientists and engineers can go, in the bathroom, in a stainless steel box with a key, is the cheapest mm -hmm. toilet paper you can imagine. There's the picture up. Good for okay, and my son just happens to have a lock picking kit for some reason, so he opened it, took a picture. Yeah. Next picture. All right. Hold and on. in the visitor center. Okay, well, let me stop the, the re has let me stop the recording. Well, you weren't. Uh, it's, okay. it's, it's it's not that bro. You just don't put it on YouTube. That first part. It's. Wait, it's like your upper left corner where it says recording. In the pause button. Pause button. Pause button for... Ah, yeah. here we go. So okay. Anyway, All right. The next picture. Okay, so let me let me share the screen here. Okay, share screen. It, it was cheap. It was bad. Locked up in a stainless steel box, right? All right. So let me and share the screen. Okay, so the there's the toilet picture, paper. It's up in the visitor center where the public has access is the Nobel Prize under some acrylic. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Isn't that something? Who's Nobel Prize? 
Ray Weiss. So he got he got one, and Kip Thorne and uh, Barry Barish, I think. Mm -hmm. But Ray bought two extras for each observatory in Livingston and Hanford. So anyway, all right, go ahead. You can you can share and record or whatever. But anyway, and that's moved now. They got a new visitor center in Hanford. If anybody goes, it's a um, a new science center. And by, maybe that's still in the front office. I don't know. But um, it was being constructed when we were there. Now, when did we do this work? Was right, it was after COVID started in like a um, September, October. So that would have been, so that would have been 20, uh, what, 2021, 20, I, I think, or 2020. I can't, I, I don't remember the dates of the. So you just click through the. Yeah, that's one? fine. That's fine. Yeah, just um, so there is um, we were there late one night, like eight or nine and uh, eight, and that's LIGO in the. At sunset. Everybody knows where this is. is Hanford, Washington. Hanford, yeah, Hanford. it's out in Hanford, yeah. This in, is the other one in Louisiana somewhere. Right, yeah. uh, Livingston, Louisiana. And okay, so here's the beam tube standing on the, uh, I think it's the bridge looking out towards the beam tube. And how long is that? 4K. Four kilometers. So there's a vacuum tube about a meter diameter, 4K long in two directions at each observatory. And they got the, the alignment of the optics to hit the target on each side. Yeah. And it's a really deep. Vacuum. Yeah, it's very hard back. So there's in the, um, I guess it's the uh, meeting room. That's the uh, events. And I, I can't read them all, but there's whenever they have a big event, probably not anymore because they, they can't have that much champagne, <laughs> I guess. But those are some of the early detections that were on the shelf. I put them on the table, took a picture. Okay, next one. So that's up on the roof. Uh, looking out towards, I think that's the, looking towards the northeast at the, um, I can't remember what nuclear plant that is over there, mm -hmm. but we got to go up there. So there is, uh, during COVID in the control room, can you take some of that stuff off? I wish I could. I I lift, it. lift it, see if you lift it up. You know, you want to see that. I wish I could just get it to go away. Can you go help? Right. Go, go about a third of the, two thirds of the way down. There's height something. Height video panel. Well, that didn't do anything. Grab it and grab it. Grab the lift. Oh, wait, wait. There we go. Better. Okay. Oh. There, there you go. So. Um, oh, you can't see it that well in that picture. We'll get to the next picture. So yeah, there's that's my son Trent who worked with us. This is actually a picture before COVID, but I put it in because this is the oh, you can't see the center, okay. the screen in the center at the top right there. This one, yeah, that's the um, that's what they're reading, and that spike on the left is the sixty hertz spike somewhere. Right here, yeah, I think that's it, or maybe, uh, or maybe there's one here. I think that's it. I'm not sure. I think I got a, a better picture. Yeah, everything all over. Yeah. And there's there's noise all over. So go to the next one. Let's see. Okay. I think you can see it. Maybe that's the same picture. Yeah. <laughs> the same time. Yeah. And it's kind of neat, but on the very left at the bottom or top of this of your image uh although on the wall oh, over here. there is the um i think it's like the calculated by bi uh, binary neutron star distance so they actually have the distance reading of what they're doing because of the noise levels when the noise is low the distance goes up kind of a, a neat little screen and that's in the control room next so so here are all the drivers 
who was talking about that somebody was for the all the actuators mm. and all those cables have to go to all over the place and so I, those are actuators for the mirrors well you know wait let's start over okay they call them actuators but trent says they're space taker uppers <laughs> okay that's that you heard me say that because what they act like is uh everybody's held the chicken right so you move the chicken and the head stays still where the neck is the actuator. So it just takes up the space. So when the earth moves, it keeps the instrument still. Ah, and, cool. the, and the primary is the hydraulic actuator. That's on the ground. The ones that we did on this build, it was only 28, um, are the internal in vacuum actuators for the, the next level. So that's a chicken sitting on top of that chicken's head. Okay. And you'll see that in a minute. So those are the drivers. Excuse me, Joe. When you say we, oh, who is we? My son and I, yes. Oh, you, you did the LIGO upgrade. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just the actuators. You'll see that okay. in a minute. Okay. I'm I was contacted. I'm going to get that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. I'll get that in a minute. So, so that's, this is inside looking, um, I guess the west, northwest the arm or something. Is this, this part this of the, the tunnel? Yeah, this is, wait, this is, no, that's the laser room right there. Yeah, this, that's okay, that's, that's the, the laser. laser room. All right. And I believe, oh, you know, I'm kind of lost here. You don't get in here very much. Or maybe that's the, I'm not, because, Hanford is different than Livingston. I'm more familiar with Livingston, but that's the beam tube going out over there. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's the beam tube. So this was. Oh, we got the point. Which button is it? The button. green button. Okay. Why is it not going to see a thing? It disappears on the monitor. It disappears on the monitor. <laughs> oh, really? It absorbs it. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, well. Okay. Laser doesn't work on the. So th this is the beam tube over here in the right. Heading out, yeah. Heading out, okay. I, I believe. <laughs> okay, there's a lot. Well, you could say there. anything, and we would go any different. Yeah. All right, we'll go to the next one. Okay, so this is the primary uh, hydraulic external uh, isolator, and that's what that actuator is there. And you can see it laying on its side there. There's one vertical and one horizontal. So that's the that's the corner of the four points that go into the chamber through bellows to hold the instrument. An instrument package. I don't know which one it is. But what is that uh, avoid? Oh, I understand. Yeah, it's on it's 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 um yeah, suspension is happy is unlocked. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Because they they turn it on and off sometimes, and when they do maintenance, it might have just put that there. So, okay, next slide. And there's another picture of them, so you can see how they're they're um, mm -hmm. on the corner yeah. of each one. Okay. Okay, so, um, I guess it was about twenty twenty or nineteen. Uh, I was contacted by the MIT engineer. He says, hey, you want to build some actuators? And I said, well, what are they? And he says, well, no problem. We got all the the uh, procedure. We got the tooling because this other company built the 300 or so that are installed now. We just need 28 more for the A-plus upgrade for the, the chamber that they're adding in. I think it's 300 meters away or something. I said, sure, why not? So we uh, we got the procedure, we got the tooling, we looked it over, bid on it, got the contract. And then I started really looking into it and I realized there's some weird stuff going on here. I didn't get it. So it was, is there any way I can contact the engineer from the company that went out of business that made these the first time, designed and made them? So we found him and we have a conversation with him on Zoom. And I'm asking him questions and he's answering, but I, I got the pi picture that he didn't build these. It was downstream to a technician, several more layers. Mm -hmm. So 
but he knew enough about it. So we talked about it. And I, so the bobbin, the electromagnetic, I want to go get the thing, but so that's the bobbin that the two coils are wound around. It's aluminum bobbin. And the 20 gauge wire, polyamide wire, wound in two directions. And the procedure said to do a high pot test after it's baked. And I noticed that they were baking it to the polyamide bake temperature of 300 C, but the wire is only good to 250. So that was the first clue that something might not be right. So I'm talking to him about this and asking him questions. And I said, hey, did you ever have any failed uh, high pot test? And he says, we had a hundred percent failure rate for two months. Mm. <laughs> so like, I, I was just, wow, this you know, is bad. I, don't, I doubt if very many people know what a high pot test Oh, it's a high voltage breakdown test of the insulation. Put a high voltage, high on, voltage on it. And if it leaks, then it's a failure. And it, it also messes. really messes it up. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, so that's the actuator. So it, the, the, it actuates in this, um, Vertical direction, I can't do. And it's only a very small amount, microns. There's magnets on the inside, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so go to the next picture. Let's see what that is. So there's a side view of it that's installed that I think I found that on the internet from LIGO. <clears throat> that's one that <clears throat> this previous company made that was installed. Okay, go to the next one. So there it is on the, see right there. Yeah, that's one, that's an actuator installed in the, on the platform. And I, I believe the, I can't remember which side is the, is the earth and which one is not the earth. It's the top of that. And the other one goes to the platform. I can't remember. So, okay, going to the next one. So this is this is so this is um there's one, two, three, and then now is the fourth thing of the suspension. So those are springs up at the top, like fishing fishing poles, the triangular pizza slices. That's a spring to support it all. The rods that go down are let's let's it traverse, and then you've got another set, and then it goes to a pent. Uh, the the third pendulum is the easiest thing to say. And then that's the test mass at the bottom left and the reaction mass is at the right. And I don't really understand all this. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. It's well, very complicated. Masses down at the bottom are actually optics, right? Right. Um, I think the reaction mass is. A, the, the intermediate one, I don't... Um, the mirror end, the mirror end of the leg of the of yeah. the interferometer, right? There, yeah, that is a piece of fused silica. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's about uh, it used to be ten inches, but I think they've increased it to like sixteen or something. But it's a metric number. And they're hung on quartz fibers that are really small. I don't know point, how they point did it. Four I, millimeter. I a video by Jason Kendall uh, on this. Um, yeah. Uh, on the and he explained it and how you, you, can, it, it, you can use some. You can tap, you can do a little demonstration. Yeah, yeah. With strings, yeah. It, it really is something. It's amazing. But they hang them on glass fibers and then they transport them and put them in place. But the glass fibers are not loaded, but then they got to release it and, and, and they have had them break. Mm -hmm. And they just get another one going. But it's, it's, uh, it's the only way it could work because of the quietness of the mm -hmm. quartz opposed to steel, which was the original. Ah. So go ahead to the next one. So, and there is, I believe that is the, uh -huh. the actual one. Wow. You're looking at some money there too. Yeah. Wow, that is so it, it, fancy it really is technology. Amazing. I've never seen that. I've seen the, the example that's in the in the showroom over there, the so visitor this, center. So this is um, between the guillotine valve so I think this is this is probably the intermediate test mass, but yeah, it's yeah. in between valves, so they yeah. can get in there. Yeah, because they, they can close off the beam tube. Yeah, they can close off the beam tube with a yeah. guillotine valve, and then they uh, they can vent this and right. go and crawl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then pump it back down and oh. open up the guillotine. Right. I know. 
<laughs> I, I know. Well, they have roof blowers that they start with, and then they the final thing they've got a cryo pump going all the time. <laughs> so go to the next one. Okay, so here we go. So LIGO had a failed actuator bobbin. So I get it. There it is. It's got resistance to the coil. So the the coil to the bobbin. So the, the original specifications wanted the bobbin to be machined, anodized. The non-surfaces that didn't touch the, the copper machined off for insulation. Well, LIGO also has a rule that says no anodized aluminum anywhere in the vacuum system, no matter what, unless approved. Well, I just said, look, I, I don't want to do that. So I got a better idea. So based on how hard it was to scrape off the polyimid off the failed bobbin, I said, I want to paint the surface with polyimid, bake it, and then wind on top of it. And they're like, well, okay, that sounds, we'll try one, you know? So that's what we did. And it worked perfect. And that way the bobbins were not anodized because anodized is porous. Mm -hmm. That's how they dye it. And they don't want it in the vacuum. So I said, hey, they're like, well, if you can not put it in the vacuum system, that's great. So here we are. So it's got resistance. So I'm lazy. I don't like to do work one time, let alone two, right? So here we go. So what do you do? You hook it up to the meter and go ahead and you start on winding until it went open. And then I found the spot. I could see it. It was one of the holes on the edge had a burr, a little burr that didn't get deburred. And the wire was touching it when it got baked, it shorted it and smooshed the polyimid down and probably had enough resistance. So there, here I am checking it in salt water so I can find the exact spot and look at the wire under the microscope and see exactly what happened. Wow. So I call this draining lot mess. I mean, you just <laughs> figure it out because I don't want to do this again because because now you got to, if, if it failed, you got to strip the bobbin and start over. And that's what this other company did. They said they had drums of copper because they didn't go figure this out. They just kept whining until they got enough to meet the contract and that's it. So there could be some at LIGO right now. They're really close to the edge that just passed the, the high voltage test. Another volt could have, you know, broke it down. But anyway, oh, so. Did you beat last week before you wound up? No. You'll see that in a minute. So what is baking? Hmm? Oh, the polyamide is, oh, you'll see the bottle of it. It's using semiconductor stuff um, for insulation. And it's a heat cure. Right? Yeah, it's like a heat cure varnishy looking stuff. And it's got volatiles. And there, the vacuum here is like better than space. Right. So they, they want to get it Literally. really, really. It's, I forget what it is. It's like 10 to the minus 12. Well, I don't think it's that high, but it's getting up there. It's, old, it's certainly nine. It's a, it's certainly nine. Yeah, it's at least ten. So the baking just gets all the volatiles out. Yeah, and it hardens it, hardens and it's it. hard. Yeah. It is like porcelain. So here's here's me and my my little shop trying to figure out what's wrong with these two failed bobbins. That's so, a nice flower there in the middle of the screen. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we, we're we're talking to this engineer. So we call him back, and we're getting on the phone with this engineer that was part of the company that built three hundred of them. And I told him, I said, "Look, I think we figured it out. What happened? I've explained everything. So here we are. My shop is attached to my house. My son is listening to me. We're on speakerphone. He's sitting there, and I'm in my living room. You know, kitchen's right there. Couch is right there. Computer desk." And the guy says, wow, you figured that out. You must have a better lab than we do. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it wasn't the lab. <laughs> it was being lazy. I don't want to do this again. So Okay, that's awesome. So anyway, so here is the cross-section of the magnet. Now, the coil and the magnets. Now, somebody can help me out on this because it's, it's opposing coils. So when you energize, it goes the other way. So the, it makes two poles, the same pole to the middle and to the outside. Okay. And but you're getting up to help me there. I'm in the way. Okay. Yeah. I can't see through your body. So the, 
the the best thing we can understand is it was based off of a voice coil from a company called um can't remember west coast company and you you wind them in two directions to cancel inductance okay so you can operate at a faster higher frequency you got that but closely I'm, coupled coils yes so when you push it it makes two north well i think okay, you know what i mean it makes two north in the middle in the black line it's going to squirt out a pole let's say it's a north and it's going to see these magnets on the side that are this way so it's going to make it go away from that north and towards the south but what happens to the other pole that goes it's going to be in the metal oh the black hash lines is are steel and it goes around to that north uh, it, it's still I, I still can't get it in my head how this thing works it sounds like it's still compensating so if as you deflect it wants to go back the other way right is I, that the idea i don't know it, no it's just to, to not have any um very precise i now these are not used much because they don't want to put any dc in it because now you're putting energy into the vacuum they might use a little bit but they try to take the DC out with the external stuff that's hydraulic. But anyway, this could go, it actuates in this direction and that direction. Yeah. And the, the dots are the wires. The pink is the aluminum. The yellow is the, or the magnets. And that's the way it, it works. So it looks like it flexes it in like this. No, it shouldn't go in. It only goes, only goes. Is the, is the idea to actively compensate for, for, any vibration. Right, right. vibration yeah. yeah so so you got a big old stack of chickens yeah. on each other's well, head i know right and right it's what it wants. Chicken head. So yeah imagine what this thing does is with the opposing magnetic fields and the way that's configured is that if it gets too far off one side or the other it, well, it's act it's closed loop so you got a geophone on the ground and then a geophone on the top of that oh, hydraulic okay. so and then a geophone so there's a feedback loop. Feedback, it's all closed loop. It tells us which way to move. Right. And it moves. And it moves fast. Okay, got so, it. Is that right? Uh, you know what? <laughs> you look like you. But I had a question. So what CAD system did you use for that? Oh, that was on a piece of cardboard really quick. And it looked okay, so I went with it. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna, I think the next is we're going to start building, making actuators. Oh, no, that's another picture of it. So the translation is from the southeast to the northwest in that image. And, it was, and that's the magnets too. So here we are in the shop making, making bobbins. Now that is a big part from my shop, but it's aluminum so we could do it in the CNC machine. So because it's thin wall, we did a lot of roughing and then started. And oh, there's, there's just a bobbin sitting up there but just for reference and stuff. So go ahead to the next one. There's a bobbin in the clean room at LIGO. And that's Trent. And we, so the original contract that LIGO wanted was all the parts get made, including the magnets and the wire, shipped to LIGO, get clean, return to the vendor to use in their clean room to assemble them in the clean room wow well, clean room i don't want to build one so i said how about you just leave them at ligo and we'll come over and use the facility to build the actuator <laughs> right i mean that's pretty easy right so they all thought that was okay it, it worked just fine so we get there and um of course, we want to wrap it. And the first thing Trent says, he says, wow, somebody knew what they were doing because he programmed all the parts on the CNC machine. <laughs> and and I did most of the running, but there you go. And it was hot. This was when the place was burning over there. Oh, so when yeah. was that all the fires? Yeah. Oh. It was before the vaccine, which would have been like- I think it's 2020. 2020, like yeah. September of 2020 is yeah. when this was. So the procedure said- Paint the polyimid on, wind a wind a layer, paint some more on, wind a layer. And I talked this over with another customer of mine, technician at another customer about winding coils, because he had done a lot. And he said, You're gonna make the biggest mess. And I said, Well, that's what I gotta try, you know. So 
Next slide. <laughs> so there's the polyamide. That's eight hundred and fifty dollars worth of polyamide, and we used about that much of it, mm -hmm. like hardly any. Okay, and it it's I think it's still in a freezer at LIGO. It's got to be kept in a freezer. Okay, go ahead. So there's painting it on and baking it. Uh, that's not baked yet. I don't know. That is baked, I think. And so that's in the class 1000 clean room. Anybody notice anything interesting there in the class 1000 clean room? The, the brush? Yeah, the brush. <laughs> um, they said to use an acid brush. It wouldn't work. So I just brought some artist paint brushes and I said, we're going to just use it. Be careful. And every now and then the hair would come off. You could see it just pulled it out. So um, it worked great because it could paint that on there and bake it. And that's better than anodizing. So, okay, there you go. Next one. So there's the mess. Isn't that beautiful? It just runs out. Mm. And we, we put that in a test cell to test it, the first one, just to verify. It made a mess. So I went and scraped all that off and we re-cleaned it. And it, I think that's actually in service. So my customer that, that told me that it's going to be making a mess, he says, take a clean room a lint free cloth and saturate it with the polyamide and let the wire run through it. Uh -huh. and that's what we did. And it worked just great. So go to the next one. So here we are. So the wire had to be unspooled clean at LIGO. That's Hugh. That's Hugh. That's the engineer at LIGO on the left. That's Trent. Um, and unspooled. And I ordered just enough wire with a little bit left over because what could go wrong? Well, that was before we found out about all the failures. So, so that's winding. Now they originally had a motor drive on the the previous company, but we tried it with the lathe, and you'll see why in the video. But we just couldn't see that this was going to work out very well for us. Okay, so um, so that's in the clean room. And remember, this is during COVID, before vaccines, and we were really careful. We all agreed we weren't going to go out and, you know, party in or anything previous to this because you and as Trent in the not. So go ahead to the next one. So when you're winding this, this is in inter, in the wine. Oh, there's the baked polyamide color. See? Um, you see how it it layers this way and then it flips over. It it it. Um, wines, right? It's your left hand coil and your right hand coil. Well, no, well, well it, it, it's just, it's the same direction, Yeah. but it, it feeds this way, then it yeah. feeds this way. So the problem was we got to try to target the same amount on each side. And I think the number was, I think it was 220 wraps on each side. We never could get to 220 just couldn't do it. We did a, a few 215s, 216s, and we talked to them about that. It was a small percentage of the wines, but I think it, it, we talked about it being more important for them to match on each side. So, but this is where you end up with, now you got to figure out, okay, do I go one more? Or do I jam it in the corner? Because one of the bobbins failed because it jammed into the corner and then baked and shorted. That one had two, two failed bobbins. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so got a wire straightener. Uh, Found that on eBay. Some guy makes them in somewhere. And we use that not only to straighten the wire, to put, put tension on it so you didn't have to hold it so tight to wind it. it. Put just a little bit of tension on it. And there's the, you can't see the crank. I think it's better in the next picture. Go ahead. Maybe it's over here. Yeah. So there's the crank and a counter so here here's um here's trent winding a coil we, we did each about the same amount because it was it was just hard you had to just concentrate and the reason i didn't like the motor drive is it's constant speed with the foot control but this you want to you want to stop you want to put it in the right spot you want to go a half a turn and put it in the right spot so you, you'll see the video of it okay to the next one Okay, so there's a counter right here. Yeah, no, that's not the video. So there, 
there we are winding uh, a bobbin. And also, you got to play a little, um, um, do a little forecasting because you want to not end up at a number in the middle. You want to make sure it gets to the end before you flip it around and, and take the bobbin off and flip it and go the other way. So I th think you keep, go to the next one, let's say. So there's another picture of it. That one's about full. I think that is full. 208, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we would, we would hold it, unscrew it, flip it around, and reverse the winding direction making sure we did everything just right. Cause that way we're always going in the same direction. And it, it was, it just worked. Um, it worked quite nice. Yeah. So go to the next one. Oh, here's the video. Oh, so the this video. is about how fast you went right here. And you laid it in, you looked, and sometimes we'd have to stop and look at it and say, should we go one more or should we start going back right now? I mean, it was that, um, it was it was that because you look at the counter and say, well, I need I need to get one more, but I don't have it. What do we do? You know, we just deal with it. So how long would it take to do one? One. A couple of hours. Yeah. Like two or three hours. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. We got better at it. Sure. You know? Sure. But we did 30. We had 30, 30. They wanted 28, but I made an extra two bobbins and they said, we want them, wind them. So, <laughs> you know, we're on the phone with them during this stuff. So, but this, you may learn something about winding the coils for the direct drive too. That's another reason I thought it'd be good to do this, to show this presentation. But can you see the, he's got a little, um, you can't really see it that well, but there's a little um, rag, or maybe that was the first one without, with the paint on. I don't see it. Maybe in another picture. Go to the next one, let's see. What, there was a... Well, he's definitely got it there, the rag, the the the, the towel with oh, the yeah. impregnated um yeah, yeah, yeah. Paint. So we'd paint on a little bit, wind a little while and so it, paint it on in the on the towel and running the wire through it. So it's it's just a thin coating on it. Okay. And it when you bake it, it doesn't drain out all over. So like the, the wire you buy the copper wire bare. No, 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 it's got okay. it's got polyamide on it. Bake. Oh, and that was another thing. Well, uh, to glue the wires together solid yeah. piece so that they they don't vibrate right and start passing or move yeah oh, and okay. stay below the surface so the manufacturer uses a wax on the wire and of course they found this out and LIGO says we got to clean that off so they had to unspool them and there's some spools down there of leftover I believe but all on the rack behind him in the foil are the clean lengths of wire that we estimated that we would need plus five percent um be, be, so it had to be cleaned the wax had to be cleaned off and we found out later that the company that was having problems just gave up and just started winding it off the spool and LIGO didn't know that mm -hmm. so that was their 100 percent failure well, no the, no the, no the the, the the deburring, we think it's mainly the, the anodize is not that good. And the, the, the burrs on the on the inside, because they had holes that went into the trough where the wire was, they weren't deburred that well. And they tried to jam in the wire to meet the number of winds, pull it really tight. We think those were the main failure modes. So there's a bunch of wax hidden in there? No, it's not not on not now. No, no. There could have been. A, not a bunch. Not a bunch. In fact, it was probably hardly any. But it was just not a clean. They said we can run you a bunch of clean wire, but you're gonna buy a pallet of it. Right. You know, so uh because they gotta clean the machine and then run the wire through the processing. Um and you see we even we even had a block of wood in there under the aluminum foil. There's a block of wood for a hand. Under rest. here? Yeah. And that shouldn't be in there, but we we made a decision to do it because we didn't have a choice to go get any other thing you, to, to do that with. But it was all wrapped up in aluminum and screwed yeah. down from the bottom. So it was fine. Um, next thing. Okay. So there's the there's the the 
the wire going through. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I think he's got one sitting on the ground. Is it sitting down? Or maybe he's just, don't know. I don't know why he, the, the, oh, we had to put it in aluminum because the chemical, which I can't remember what it was, started going through the glove and oh. it made his, his fingers wrinkly and mine too. So we just wrapped a little towel in aluminum. I don't know why he set it down. He's probably adjusting something, but that's the, uh, that's winding the coils. Okay. And it was hot so, in there too. So can you pause? Part way through doing this, or do you just have to keep going until when it's done? We can wait a little bit, but we want to we want to get it finished mm -hmm. to um, to put it aside and get ready to bake. Well, there's more to this. Okay, so yeah, we couldn't wait for the next day. Like once you start one, you really need to finish it. Yeah. Okay. So so there's a two hundred and seven, and so I had to dream up all these little clamps to hold it down. The most effective way so you see how it bulges up in the middle a little bit mm -hmm. that had to be flush with the surface bar below and the original manufacturer had these clamps with these big teflon blocks and we just couldn't see it so we did something different we had strips of teflon that we glued that we screwed to a plate to clamp it down and that didn't work because pushing it down, the wire wants to squirt out the side, trying to clamp it. They had too tight of a bin there that should have almost been an ellip ellipse, feeding mm -hmm. the wire gradually into the flat. That would have helped. And maybe not trying to pack so much wire in the thing because the engineer probably took a cross section and filled it with dots and said, oh, sure, it'll all fit. Well, it doesn't work like that when you're winding. So, so what we did was on the fly we, we didn't um we quit pushing it down and actually trent thought of this he said let's slide it on like a sled so we hooked the teflon strips to the aluminum plate and put it on the edge and pushed and slid it over but it was still really hard and you'll see the next picture i think it's the next one no anyway that's a that's a completed bobbin and the wires all look good yeah. Okay, go to the next one. Oh, there's a polyamid painted, baked, ready to go. So it just took an extra step because it had to be painted, baked, and then the next day wound on. Okay, next one. Okay, that's me painting or doing something, setting something up. Oh, it's probably that's the little slide to, to clamp the wires down, to smash the when you'll see that in a second. Um yeah, there's some. So look at that nice looking lamp in the clean room, huh? <laughs> well, we needed we needed something, so we was found something and give it a little wipe down. And that's a dust. That's a fume extractor because the chemical, it was it was, it was not a safe chemical, but you could hardly smell it. it just wasn't that strong. So the so next one didn't, instead of aluminum, they didn't use Teflon for the bobbin. Uh, movement probably Maybe. yeah so here we are smashing this thing down with my arm trying to put screws in to, to hold it flat before it goes into the oven to bake it was really hard and one of them we just couldn't get it so we put some aluminum foil on the ground and aluminum foil on top and i stood on it to get it to to, to smash down um so in the lessons learned report after this uh, I said, if you ever want to do this again, call me to design it because a few little changes would have made a big difference in just making it easier and more uh, safe to build. So, and there's Hugh, that's Trent, and me. Yeah. All that pressure and squeezing the wires together, you weren't worried about yes. and falling into it? Of course. Yes, we right. were. We were. Okay. But on, on machining the bobbin, we we when we found out that the burr on the inside, because they anodized it, the original builder, designer builder, anodized it and then machined it, they actually put the holes in and they didn't deburr very well. So our last operation on the CNC machine was with a big um uh, like a big key cutter. I say big, big in my shop, it was that big around. Um 
and made the pass around it so there was no burr sticking out. So that was the last one. And of course we inspected it because we didn't want any sharp edges. And in the lessons learned, I said, don't put the holes through, do blind holes. Well, you can't, you gotta watch blind holes because now you gotta vent the fastener. Maybe you could put a small hole, but you, you don't want any sharp edges and you don't want any polyimid flowing up into the, into the threads of the screw holes that you might've seen on the bobbin. It was, um, it was designed and built. It wasn't designed and tried and designed and tried and designed and tried and then finalized the original design of this thing. It wasn't designed for manufacture. Yeah, and that, that's where I can be in lazy and not wanting to do work once, let alone twice. Um, I can think all that through uh, pretty good. So there we are. So, And so there's the clamps. You can kind of see it. That's the clamps. And you see the little Teflon pad flip? Yeah, the little Teflon piece of tape. And the, the reason I wanted to use tape rather than a block is because you could see that when they had their blocks on it, because I got the old tooling, it's stuck. So I'm thinking, we'll just use some Teflon strips that I cut up, you know, with a razor blade and a ruler. So you could peel it off and you wouldn't try to lift anything and pop a wire loose. So this is like the Teflon tape you get for plumbing? No, no, no. This this is Teflon sheet. Oh, sheet. Of sheet. Okay, okay, let's call it sheet. It's, I don't know, it was like 10,000 stick, McMaster car, razor blade, let's cut it on a thing. And that was the strips we used. You see it kind of clamps it. I think the clamp is on the other side and that's the side that was free because we, we slid it on like a sled. Um, yeah. So there we are putting that that clamp on to go in the oven to bake and it baked overnight. And that was another thing we were really careful. And you might know this to not have an oven overshoot because there's a lag in the, in the temperature thing. We wanted to make sure it, we didn't like going to 300. I tried to talk him into going to 250 because the polyimid people says, yeah, you can bake it to 250. Just do it an extra hour or whatever it was. And LIGO says, oh, no, I want to do that. But I said, if it fails, the first one fails the high pot test, we got a meeting coming up. So we're going to we're going to figure something out. I can't keep making these, you know, so but it worked. And of course, I did testing it at my in my laboratory. You know, <laughs> I, I wound I wound caught the wire around some aluminum and baked it to 350 and then tested it, looked at it on the microscope and it smashed the polyimid, but it never did leak. We dip it in salt water, it didn't leak. So we're almost done, you know, let's see. So then, oh, here we are pushing some wires around with a Teflon probe just to make it fit. You can see the, it's clamped on that end and it slid from that way but it's already clamped. It's just pushing stuff around, getting it just right before you put it in the oven. And that's that nice lamp again. It actually worked great. Oh, okay. So there's a stack of actuators, space taker uppers, and um, that's a that's the testing, the final testing unit to make sure everything's right. And I think that's about it. We're about done there. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Ouch. So how long did all this take? Well, all the machining and stuff took a year or, or something. Plus there was delays and all this stuff, the, getting the magnets in, because the magnets all had to be installed in the plate. And and that's another thing with these magnets. You just can't lay them out because <laughs> yeah. you, you get a ball of magnets. <laughs> right. So they shipped them in a little cardboard box, which I'll show you with foam. And we did, we did make, we, you know, just, just cardboard. It was, it, it was spaced enough so they could, they would stick together, but they wouldn't be so close that they would smash the stuff. But that's where we have broke another rule because we put it underneath the curtain and opened it up, took the magnet out, went and installed it, you know, four feet away, put the cardboard back under the curtain and did our best to keep the cardboard low. But that's what you have to do when you have, um, uh, 28 times 16 magnets. These are neodymium magnets? Samarium cobalt, because they have to be baked. Because okay. this thing gets dipped again in IPA, washed, mm -hmm. and then baked again. Oh. And yeah. then mm -hmm. goes in the RGA to make sure before it goes in vacuum. So you were 
almost like living in the cleaning room at LIGO. Or... Yeah, it was, we spent three, the first <clears> time <throat> we bailed early because we had to go remake some tooling. So we did one and, oh, let's go fix some stuff. So that was like a five days. And then the next day was, the next time was about 10 and the next one was about seven days. Um, spaced about a couple of weeks apart or something like that just to go figure the last two were, I think were just a, a, a week apart just to go home and figure it all out um, so anyway there's there's a, a stack of these things and they all had to be torqued down you know Trent did a lot of the final assembly on everything let's see what's next okay and here's what you get that's the uh, that's the signals. Um, you've seen this before. Oh yeah, these are the gravitational that's the wave. One. That's yeah. the first one. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And I think I got the next picture is a uh... yeah, and that's mm -hmm. the other picture. But that was a twenty. Those are gravitational wave signals, right? Yeah, that's the twenty fifteen. Oh yeah, yeah. And that was another thing. Yeah, this is like the holy cow it works. Results. Well, I've been working with them for like 23 or four years. I, I'm sorry, do you have any before and after the, your upgrade results? You did a well, thing. I didn't, all I did was make the act, the upgrade is squeeze light. If you want to go look and see what squeeze light is, good luck. That, I could not, anybody know? Yeah, maybe you understand my question, but okay. No, I, I don't. The upgrade, I think, it, I think it almost doubled it, but this was just the suspension. Yeah. Part of the suspension for the squeeze light stuff. Did your did your suspension work? You replaced all of these actions. Oh yeah, they, they worked before they went in vacuum. Did they yeah. did they make an improvement to what was there before? Oh it's a, no, the, 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 once you get the these things built, they pretty much work the same. So the reason for they needed extras. They needed extras. They needed extras. For okay. the squeeze light cabin. Got it. Right. Okay. 28, right, 28 extras. Right. Okay. And they may need some more because India, there wasn't enough built for India. So if India wants to do the squeeze light, the LIGO India that's coming up, they're going to need some more. So, but yeah. we know how to do them now. Yeah. If I can remember. But anyway, the, um, yeah, it is, it is pretty interesting. Um, but there's so much more to, I mean, this was just a suspension. And this is, you know, Howard said, can you talk about something? I thought winding the coil might, you know, be something everybody was interested in with the direct drive motors and the magnets too. The, so the, the only reason to use some cobalt is because of the bake temperature, not the power. They're weaker than, than, than um, yeah, yeah. neodymium. And, and of course they're, they're baked and plated with nickel, the magnets, because they go into cleaning. And that was another thing. So the, the procedure was for LIGO to get the magnets in, clean them, return them to the vendor to be installed, of course. And I don't know how they did 300 or whatever it was times 16 magnets, how they cleaned them. I just don't know. There's a guy retired. You just can't put them on a tray Right, <laughs> I mean, you get a ball of magnets. You can't get; the, they're all wrecked. So, I came up with this idea it was during a LIGO meeting. I said, "Wait, you're going to clean this thing again after, huh?" Oh yeah, okay. Well, it said, "Oh, okay, hang on." So I called the magnet place to just stop because they were just about ready to start magnetizing. I said, "Just stop. Don't do anything. I'll call you back." So I got with LIGO. I said, "How about this? How about if we get the magnet company to clean them to your spec?" ultrasonic di i mean di water and and ipa and then bag them clean make a little clean area and then magnetize it and they're like you kidding can that be done i said well we're going to find out because now ligo doesn't have to handle magnets right right so i called up the guy and so I, they i bought them a ultrasonic cleaner that's what I, I, I was I wanted to get it back but they they set up a little area and they they did it and magnetized it in the bag so it came in a bag a double bag in a styrofoam and a little cardboard box and they were clean and 
I didn't worry about it because LIGO is going to clean it again. And then RGA it. So I'm thinking, oh, like, yeah, we're going to, what could go wrong? You know, and, and actually it worked. What's RGA? Uh, residual gas analyzer oh. in vacuum. So they, they peak it, bake, bake it, and they look and they, they smell it and see if anything's coming off because it, it, if it, if it outgasses anything, and that was another question. I said, what about the bubbles trapped in the polyembit? You're going to have bubbles, right, of air. They said, well, we tested it. There's, it's not a problem. Well, it was, I'm the one that's going to get the problem. When it, <laughs> but apparently, it, it, if, it, if there are bubbles in it, they don't leak out the polyembit. Because I would have thought that it would be like a virtual leak forever to have a little tiny air bubble you know, leaking through the polyembit. But um yeah so it was uh so so yeah i didn't know anything about winding coils but i i learned quick um so anyway any questions anything uh, that's, i think that's about it so you said the magnet manufacturer uh they shipped it shipped them clean clean and why do they still have to clean no 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 they that was the reason they didn't have to handle loose magnets once they're installed in the plate and in the actuator, the field is kind of contained in the steel, right? So they can take the actuators and put them next to each other and they don't stick. So they they clean the actuator again before they put it into the the additional, it's a low temperature bake, I believe, for the analyzer to see if it's, and that's the final check clean before anything goes in vacuum. And they do that with everything they can, the stuff they can't, like the chambers, they ship it somewhere and it gets clean. I don't know how they do it, but they chemically clean it and seal it and return it. And it's safe to go in vacuum. So. I have a question about the cervical space where these new activators went. Mm -hmm. Did it make something longer or was it like an oh. add on work? It, it was they they added a um a tunnel and i can't remember how long it is 100 meters 300 meters or something on the inside of the thing to to and the, the, and this was for the chamber on the end to suspend it um and they they did not want the hydraulics they said no we can do it all with this so that's what they did and it has to do something with squeeze light. Anybody welcome to go read about it and let me know next year? Um, Good luck. Is, is that light fresh? What? The, the squeeze light. Is that oh, fresh? fresh, yeah. Fresh squeeze light. <laughs> you know, the, the you can read about it, but it's like they, they, they give up some momentum to get a position, measure that really good, and then they give up the position to measure the momentum, measure that, and now they can combine that so they can increase the... I guess the, the noise lowers. I yeah, think the, the quantum. Yeah. Quantum, uh, I just read. I just. I. I, I never heard of it. I heard like, they're taking, yeah. I just, they're taking they're measurements down along the to the scale of the plant length now. Oh, that's that right? just, well. Yeah, but they but they can only read the. They look at the dark fringe and they look at photons coming through. Yeah, yeah. But how that it's just so complicated. I don't think there's any one person that understands the whole thing. But it sure. was. I mean, I tr I tried to. To read about There's this. a Nobel Prize for that. Yeah, so it, the original. but but this was just a little nothing actuator, and I, it's space taker rubber, right? Yeah. Um, and oh, well, it's another thing too, with this high pot test of 500 volts. Um, I said, well, how much? This thing's only good using it's operating at 28 max. I said, can I do 250? <laughs> Because I was really concerned about it, and there was a few other engineers that says, "Yeah, it's just silly to attempt it to fail because once it breaks down, it's you got to unwind it." And I never, I didn't know how to strip the polyimid. If we had to unwind one and strip the polyimid, I don't think you can because it's polyimid. So I think I, I thought we'd just have to paint over it, but now we lost some dimension, so we might not get as many winds on it. And then I said, well, let's go look in the control room and see what they're operating at. And their, their operational voltage is really low because they don't, don't want to put a lot of energy in. And I think that's why that copper piece was on there was to suck some heat out or, or, or easily or to get the heat out if there was any in there. But 
And it's pretty remarkable, yeah. But um, anyway, 28 actuators and 30 bobbins later. Mm -hmm. So they got extra bobbins because you could easily damage one. You know, if you, if you broke a wire or something like that, if you scratched it, you could just put some polyamide on it and rebake it, I guess, or just leave it. As long as it's not touching anything, it should be fine. But it, um, but anyway, that's it. Any, any questions on the, on the, any questions out there, Zoomies? Oh, they all left. <laughs> oh, um, the magnets were expensive. The steel plates, I got them to size, and all we did was drill the holes. So there was a lot of that. Are you planning to make a gravity the, wave observatory? The 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 polyamide was eight hundred and fifty dollars, and I tried so hard to get them to sell me just a little bit. Mm -hmm. and no, <laughs> so um, I think each one was around. I'd have to do some math because we had extra charges for the engineering. Uh, I don't know, twelve thousand, something like that. Was one, yeah. Did you make a there? Yeah, we did okay. Okay. But it, it was um it was a lot of work trying not to fail one and doing all the unwinding and looking through how what failed. Because I wanted to find out what failed. Drain lock nets. I want to find out, right? Before you do it. Before I because but you know, David, you had a hundred percent yield on your on your they all made it, all thirty. Excellent. All thirty. And Good work. I, I sent an email back to the engineer that had failures for 100% failure rate for two months. I never got a reply back. <laughs> so, yeah. None, none, none. But I did find the technician that actually physically wound most of the 300, like 95% of them. And she lived in Slidell's where I used to live a couple of miles away because it was right close to LIGO was where PSI was. There's a little space hub there because of Stennis Space Center and stuff. And I called her up and I learned so much more from her than I did. And that was her job. She all Her whole career was doing technical stuff like that for whatever group needed it. And she might have even been contract for like Stennis Space Center, any technical, you know, technician stuff. And I learned more from her talking to her for a few hours than from the engineer because he didn't do the work. Yeah. You know, and um, and because I guess the structure was so layered, the the information from the technician, you know, she might have been allowed to even say anything, just build another one, and not even study it. Just, just why? why and actually, they they did. She did it with a foot pedal. I said, "How did you do that?" You know? But she apparently got she got good at it, um, because she did almost three hundred of them or something. Yeah. So. I mean, you know, probably more than that because of the failures. Yeah. She might have done four or five hundred. I went on some coils on Dan's coil, mm -hmm. and the the last speed was a lot better than the first. Yeah, but it wasn't too many gauge. The heavy wire is really hard. Yeah, because yeah. you got to get to the end. You want to cram it. When do you when do you want to stop trying to get it into the? Like, do you really want to cram it in that spot? You know, we look at it and say, no, let's go back. So we go back the other way and try to flip it over to the next layer because it, it drops into the holes you know? and then you end up on the end and it's like oh we should have we should you want to back up you know and sometimes we did we backed up somebody just backed yeah. up and we, we did it and went back and, yeah. well, and there's probably all school, over the place I think the end was full of copper um, oh no we had measured pieces cut out okay so you and those did. little pieces, those little coils on the bottom shelf were the leftovers. Okay. And we never did run out. We made sure of that. And yeah. You can't just exactly solder an extension on no. coiling. No. <laughs> oh, and that wire was expensive yeah. too. Yeah. And and that's why I, I didn't want to make a mistake because now you got to buy. I, I dropped um, three magnets, putting them on. It just, because I, I had a little spot on the surface plate that I just wanted to, on, with IPA, just to knock any um, points off of the nickel plating because I was having trouble sliding it on this nickel plated steel. So I just did that a few times it, it, and it dropped under the steel <laughs> and, boom, and, grabbed, and I can't use it. And, and that's what that one is over there. It's one that fell. Perfectly looks fine, but I, I can't put it in. So you know, the magnets were like 60 bucks a piece or something. 
So, but anyway, it is a it is an interesting uh, is an interesting project, and just hanging out at the observatory. Not many people were there. That's kind of fun when people were there, but there was just a few people there because of the sure. COVID, and they um, they quit observing. And, and I said, well, why didn't you just keep observing? Because it's set up to run remotely. You could run it from your house. Just log in and just look at, keep everything locked, collect data. And they realized that after they stopped yeah. for the upgrade, it, it, they may have, I don't know. But it seemed like that would have been easy to do. But, you know, nobody knew what was going to happen, you know, when it first started. So when it when they first went on these lockdowns, they, they – um, Send everybody home and shut it off, except for the critical keeping the vacuum up, and I think stuff like that. But it's a, it's a, if anybody's out in Eastern Washington, they have a visitor center that's really nice. Uh, and is it still out on site? Yeah, yeah. So they made a new one, which I haven't been to the new one yet, but all the old stuff is in the new new one that was in the lobby. But they were they were moving dirt around. We were just leaving. They were just starting to build it. And yeah, oh, it's pretty neat. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I guess right. that's it. Right. Got you. Thank you. That's here. Since nobody will see this. Okay, so that's the end of today's morning session. And uh yeah, pretty close to on time. So we're gonna take a lunch break until two o'clock. So um, tune back in then, and we'll have the last few presentations and our final wrap. So thank you to everyone for 